good evening. I'm calling to order the regular meeting of the Arlington School Committee on Thursday, February 9th, 2023. I'm Liz Exton, the chair. Uh, we're all in person. Oh, actually, I'm not going to confirm members that are remote because it doesn't seem like we have. Hmm. Okay. Uh, tonight's meeting of the Arlington School Committee is being conducted in a hybrid model. Before we begin, permit me to offer a few notes. First, this meeting is being conducted via Zoom, is being recorded, and is also being simultaneously broadcast on ACMI. Persons wishing to join the meeting by Zoom may find information on how to do so on the town's website. Persons participating by Zoom are reminded that they may be visible to others and that if you wish to participate, you are asked to provide your full name in the interest of developing a record of the meeting. All participants are advised that people may be listening who do not provide comment and those persons are not required to identify themselves. Both Zoom participants and persons watching on ACMI can follow the posted agenda materials also found on the town's website using the Novus Agenda platform. And we are all in person. We will not need to take all of our votes by roll call. All right. Our first item on our agenda is public comment. We do not have anyone signed up for public comment. Okay. <clears throat> our next item on the agenda are AHS student representatives to the school committee. I don't see anyone here. Anybody on the... Uh, Zoom? No? Okay. All right. Next, we have um, a recommendation and possible vote for the Deputy Superintendent for Teaching and Learning, and I will turn this over to Dr. Homan. All right. Um, so I am very happy to announce that we have concluded our process for determining who would be my recommendation for the next Deputy, or the new Deputy Superintendent of Teaching and Learning, which is an adjusted um, just a title from the one Dr. McNeil <laughs> currently holds. Uh, we've gone through a very comprehensive process to select the individual that I am recommending to you tonight. We had an initial committee uh, of 15 community members who donated significant time to initially interview 11 competitive candidates for this important role. Those members underwent some orientation and um, bias in hiring training ahead of us welcoming the candidates for the initial round of interviews. And we had a process monitor as well on that committee to help us um, think about the candidates that we had seen and what the process, how the process was going and reflect on um, how we were asking questions and how that process went. Throughout all stages of the process, we were seeking as much input from community members as we could. Once we got to the final round, we put forward three finalists, and those finalists engaged in school visits where they met with students, teachers, and administrators. Um, they engaged in forums, uh, virtual forums with families, staff, and administrators, um, and they came to see the cabinet team, meet the central office team, and also did a one-on-one -on -one session with me. They also held a session with the people who they would potentially be the direct supervisors of. Hi, Tamaki, how are you? Um, so in, uh, at the end of that process, I went through all of the feedback, and all of the feedback for all three candidates was very strong. And that led me to think through what the skill sets were that each candidate brought to the process. And tonight, the recommendation that I am bringing to you is that Ms. Mona Ford Walker be our next Deputy Superintendent of Teaching and Learning. And she is here. I'm sure we'll welcome her up in a moment to say a few words. Throughout all stages of our process, Ms. Ford Walker demonstrated deep knowledge of what is required in order for our system to have excellent teaching and learning that is student and equity centered. Um, in her interviews, she talked about how she would lead school-based teams to support teaching and learning. She talked about powerful professional learning and what the components of that are, including elements of professional learning that we've already begun implementing, surrounding giving teachers choice, making sure that uh, good professional development is job embedded and instructionally focused. She talked about instructional leadership teams and what it looks like to lead groups of leaders in constructing and enacting excellent practices and studying good practice through the instructional leadership team. And she has experience at the uh, administrative level, at middle school, elementary, and the district level, uh, where she's currently serving as interim special education director and a um, superintendent resident in the Revere Public Schools. Her experience is very complementary to mine and my own leadership background, and I look forward to working with her as a partner in leading the Arlington Public Schools for the next several years. 
Uh, we've conducted some extensive reference tech checks as part of the process and received excellent feedback on every aspect of Ms. Ford Walker's leadership. Particularly though, I want to call out that we heard so much about her humility, approachability, relationality as a leader and her exceptional leadership skills. With all of that said, I will welcome Ms. Ford Walker to the Arlington Public Schools pending, of course, the approval of the school committee. You have a uh, copy of a contract to consider as well uh, in your materials for tonight. And I will leave it open to any questions that you have for myself, for Ms. Ford Walker, or about the contract. Thank you. <clears throat> Ms. Ford Walker, would you mind uh, joining us at the table? Congratulations and welcome. Um, I will open this up to the committee. If, or actually, would you like to say something uh, first and introduce yourself? I apologize. That's okay. Good evening. Can you hear me? Good evening, uh, school committee members, Dr. Holman and leadership team, as well as uh, the community and town of Arlington. Thank you so much for uh, having me here this evening. Um, I do want to start off by saying thank you for this opportunity. Um, I've had the privilege of visiting a few schools in Arlington, talking to a number of students and staff, and um, the one thing that I recognize is that this is a special community, a special town, and it's a committed group of people who want the best for their town and for the students that attend the schools. And so I'm extremely impressed by um, just the conversations that I was able to have with students, particularly at Harlington High School and how they expressed um, what they wanted for their school community. And so I thank you for the opportunity to um, allow me to contribute to the great work that's taking place and the work that will take place in the community. Thank you. Anybody comment, question? Mr. Thielman. We're very glad you're here. And in the uh, private dinner we had beforehand, to which the public was not invited. Um, <laughs> invited. It was invited. publicly posted. Oh, the public is invited. Okay. <laughs> Sorry, I was just. Uh, Trying to make a joke there. <laughs> it didn't land well. Uh, but um, you said uh, something that I thought was great. And you, you asked us a question, which is, which neighborhoods should I visit first in Arlington? So I thought that was uh, says a lot about you. You want to get to know our community and our kids and our families. And that's, uh, that's exactly what we need. So that says a lot about you. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Mr. Stephan? I move approval of the contract between the Arlington School Committee and Mona Ford Walker and, the, and authorize the chair to sign on our behalf. Second. We have a motion by Mr. Schlickman, seconded by Mr. Hainer. Any more discussion? Roll call vote. Ms. I'm sorry. Okay, Mr. Hainer? Yes. <laughs> Mr. Cardin? Yes. Ms. Morgan? Yes. Mr. Schlickman? Yes. Mr. Thielman? Yes. Dr. Allison Ampey? Yes. And I vote yes. That's unanimous. Congratulations. Mr. Hainer. I just wanted to add, I just wanted to add, I think it was uh, very fortunate that we did not get another Elizabeth. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you. Welcome. Thank, Thank you, you and you. welcome. I'm glad you're here. Okay. Um, our student reps are here, Tamaki and Amy. If you, uh, we'll pass you the mic if you want to. Mm -hmm. Give us an update. Oh! Missed a big moment. Yeah. <laughs> Do it again. <laughs> Sorry. Aww. Should we do it again? Yeah. Should we do it again? Do it again. Do it again. <laughs> I know. Should we let him? All right. Another minute. Do you want to call me again? Do we have the kids to do? No. All right, to, yeah, no, let, we'll can, I'll let, yeah. Yeah, let the, yeah, Tamaki and Amy, go ahead and share about the high school. Um, the wrestling team won their league for the fifth time in the row. Wow. So, good for them. Anything, Amy? Well, it's their last meet in the pit before the new building. Well, I guess Fusco gets torn down, so that's a pretty big moment. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Very emotional. Yay. Thank you. Thank you. Um, welcome. We have more visitors, so we are going to reenact our <laughs> approval of your contract for your for your family. So, Mr. I have a different, have a different motion, actually. Yeah. Okay, <laughs> Mr. Carton. I move that we appoint uh, Mona Ford, Ford Walker, Ford Walker 
as our deputy superintendent effective July 1st. Second. We have a motion by Mr. Cardin, seconded by Mr. Hainer. Roll call vote. Ms. Or discussion? Roll call vote. Mr. Hainer. Yes. Mr. Cardin. Yes. Ms. Morgan. Yes. Mr. Schlickman. Yes. Mr. Thielman. Yes. Dr. Allison Ampey. Yes. And I vote yes. That's unanimous. Congratulations. I was going to ask for a reference check. There. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that, that sweet, sweet child. The hugs. Is, yes. That's a vote of confidence. All right. Um, next, we have a social emotional learning presentation. Um, and I just, we have a lot of presentations this evening. So I will sort of give you a you're halfway through your time cue just so you can keep on track all right so thank you so much yes please um and someone will get your slides Driving. ready for you i wasn't sure yep i'm i'm gonna drive Probably for you yeah mm -hmm. high school committee and hello everyone Hi. thanks for having me and if you'll just it, I, didn't, I don't want to mispronounce your name, so if you'll introduce I yourself. That. I understand. <laughs> Can I actually start sure, first? Of course. Yes. So um, welcome, Mogali. It's Mogali Olander. Did yes. I say your last Mogali name right? Mogali Olander. Olander. Um, and she has been our interim director of social emotional learning and school counseling since October, I think? Yes. Yes. Uh, yes. And um, is doing a spectacular job and has been a wonderful partner to our school teams, a great leader for our school counselors, and really um, was sort of thrown into the role and has been wonderful, wonderful to have on the administrative team. This is her first presentation to this committee, so I wanted to make sure we introduced her and told everybody what a wonderful <laughs> job she's been doing. Um, and I'll hand it off to her. Thank you. So I did make slides. I will oh, they're not breeze through them. <clears throat> Um, but obviously the first order of business is to introduce myself. I am Magali. In presentation mode. <coughs> Hold on. I will figure this out. So I'm Magali Olander. I, I know many of you. I have voted for some of you because I'm also a resident. Um, some of us. <laughs> <laughs> well, that says more about my voting record, like my getting to the polls than anything else. Um, and um, so I, have, I'm, I live here. I work here. I started my school social work career here in Arlington in 2009 at the high school working in what is now called the REACH program within the special ed department. But I've been a social worker since 2000. And um, what I want to share you by way of introduction, oh, I, I took a little break in between, took a little hiatus over, went over to Chelsea, was an assistant principal at Chelsea High School for four years, um, but couldn't stay away from Arlington. Also kind of needed to get back to or was very excited to get back to um, a leadership role around social emotional learning well-being mental health um, and and being with my people the, my fellow social workers and counselors and also in my town um, I what I want to share a little bit with you is a, a bit about my why so you know where I'm coming from I in my slide presentation there's a delightful picture of my children so um, to, to communicate that my why is the kids. I think a lot of us, many of us in education say our why is the kids. And my particular s flavor of that is as a social worker, I've always seen myself as an advocate for kids because we adults build systems that we ask kids to be a part of. And sometimes we're good about making those systems work well for them and sometimes we need their input, and as a social worker, I've always seen it as an opportunity to be the advocate for um, helping the systems work as well as possible for kids, and I've always wanted to do that from inside those systems, um, and so being able to be in a leadership role where I'm thinking about what I'm passionate about professionally, social emotional learning and well-being and mental health, and also working directly on behalf of and with kids and also really supporting the people that are doing all the work working with and supporting our kids gets me gets me jazzed so that's why I'm here 
Um, that is my why. You're going to have to see the picture of the kids. I'm sorry. We're going to have to get there. <laughs> Keep going. Go. Go. Keep there they are. <laughs> That's my delightful teenagers. Um, so what I also want to show next is just a little bit about my vision. So I'm not, um, obviously, I'm, as Liz, Dr. Homan said, I'm relatively new here in this role. I'm not new to mental health and social emotional learning, but I'm new to getting to lead it. And so I want to share a little bit about my vision, um, where, I land, where, where we're at right now, where my vision is at right now, because it is and needs to stay an evolving thing that is responsive to what the needs are in front of us. So I share with you the MTSS framework right now that is anchoring my thinking about social emotional learning and mental health in schools. Everyone's seen versions of the pyramid, the triangle, the tiers of support. But what, what this reminds me of, what's important about this image for me, is that it is all happening all the time. It's, we never trade out mental health for SEL. We never trade out tier one for tier three. We're doing it all, which is a big ask. It's a lot of, it's a tall order, but it is, always happening and ideally we're getting the right amount of it to where it's needed at the right time and in the right distribution. So that is how, what kind of grounds my thinking about how it's a part of everything we're doing. Next slide, thank you. Um, and just not surprisingly, as a, as a social emotional and mental health leader, I do believe that the five CASEL standards um, are, are the anchor and the underpinning for how, as a school, we can reach our vision. Um, I, I, Self-awareness, self-management, social awareness, relationship skills, and responsible decision-making are the foundational skills that we all need forever. And um, I think they, they lay the fertile ground for our vision becoming a reality. If you go to the next slide, I'm going to get a little deeper into just the how. How would focusing on these five competencies get us to our vision? So I just wanted to share that if you look at the, the five competencies that I just laid out and how they can lead to these core constructs of identity, agency, belonging, collaborative problem solving, and curiosity, like that is the work that strong and social emotional learning can, can do for us. So that's, that can move us there. That is our vision. Um, so I do believe that, uh, and I'm grateful that Arlington has invested as much as it has in social emotional learning and mental health because I do think um, it could kind of be the, the water that we surf in on for all the rest of the amazing things we do. Not that I'm biased or anything that social emotional learning is it. But, um, so that's a little bit about where I, my lens, where I come from, where my current thinking is about how important this work is for the work that we're trying to do for our Arlington students and families and our staff. So I, I'm just gonna share a quick update from the different sort of teams that I work with and that'll be it. So we have a social emotional learning team which this year is comprised of a three SEL coaches. One is a permanent position that we will We've had for a couple of years, and we'll keep having two currently are grant funded um, by a, a DESE grant that we are fortunate to be supported by right now for our SEL work. They are working across the district, supporting in various ways, individual coaching, team coaching, working with administrators, supporting different initiatives that different schools are doing. So they're really a little bit of everything everywhere, and it's been great. We're learning a lot from them about what our schools are needing and wanting more of. So that's really helpful for planning going forward. Our elementary schools continue to mostly implement second step as our social emotional curriculum at the elementary level. Many are also engaging in res um, responsive classroom practices, which also support social emotional well-being and mental health. Um, some highlights from the Gibbs, we've had the opportunity as an SEL team to provide some direct instruction with students at a truly tier one level, like we're there with every kid when different core academic departments have been out on professional learning days. So like the math team was out for a couple days, SEL team moved right in and taught some SEL lessons directly to, um, we've done two days so far, and we're gonna do two more days when the social studies team goes out for professional learning. So we're really getting to get in there and do some real tier one instruction in that way. The SEL team has been critical in that. 
um, work at the Audison to build on the work that's already in place with the support of our SEL coaches and their kind of expert lens on how this work does live structurally in schools. We're embarking on an audit to really highlight what folks are already doing, build on the practices that are already strong, and learn with the staff at Audison like where they want to grow, where they need support, what that looks like for building SEL. And when I say, when I'm saying SEL, just to be clear, I'm talking really about the tier one, like how are we getting this to everyone? And that is, that is sort of like the frontier of education for most, for many school districts right now. We're, we're throwing a lot at it, which is exciting, but it is still, um, that this is where we're growing. So that's what we're focused on right now at Audison. Um, another highlight, um, the team is working with the high school to really think about where, where, how does collaborative problem solving as a, as a modality support the universal teaching of social emotional competencies as well. So really getting in there and again, building on a foundation that they've already invested in, that they believe in, and that it feels meaningful on some level already and saying, great, let's, how do we, how do we get this learning and teaching happening for all adults and students? And then last but not least, our social emotional team, especially with the support of this grant, has been um, gone through a formal process of some social emotional competency data collection that we are just about ready to churn out into a, it comes back in a lot of build jillions of numbers from the states as the state is helping us, the screener we use is called Celis, um, and we're about to get some, some data back to the schools. Um, about how their students perceive their own social emotional strengths and areas for growth, and then use that data as well to continue to inform what we're building for the rest of this year and going forward. So that's our SEL team. That's sort of not everything, of course, but that is, those are some highlights. In our mental health programming, um, we have one district-wide social worker that is dedicated to support, supporting the mental health, the universal mental health screening work. Before I stepped into this role, I was also kind of on that team working with Sarah Bird, um, also coordinating the mental health screening work and then the follow-up programming. Relatively new for Arlington across all the schools to do mental, universal mental health screening. Started in the spring of 2020 and have grown from there to really try and implement a universal program of taking some dipstick data on how are our kids doing right now, what do they need right now, and trying to get it to them. Um, so we've continued to do that. We've screened, last year we mental health screened about 2,600 Arlington students. Um, around every, every student that scored in an elevated range was offered some kind of support, whether that was a tier two intervention like a group, um, support finding an outside therapist, just more supports sort of implemented during the school day. Um, and, so, and so this is being like the, the second really full year of a universal screening program that has been working with grades three through 12. We've now had enough time to learn some key, we've, we've done some like key learning about how to make this work even better. And so uh, the district-wide social worker and I just recently started working with an interdisciplinary team of, of teachers administrators and social workers to think about how do we make this even more responsive, more effective um, going forward. So we want to continue to grow this programming and keep it nimble enough to be responding to the needs that we're seeing. Um, and our interventions so far seem to be working. The initial data is telling us kids that got the intervention did feel a little less distressed, anxious, and depressed after. So um, that's exciting. Next. And last, I just want to share some updates about the actual teams of folks that are in the buildings doing so much of this work. They do lots of things in the buildings, but I'm going to just tell you a little bit about the things that they're doing with me for, you know, in my department. So the elementary social work teams continue to do all the things that they do, plus they have taken on an enormous role in supporting both the mental health, universal mental health screening work and the uh, social emotional learning that's taking place. So they have been pivotal in making sure that, that the screening gets done to fidelity and that the interventions are, are made available to every student. The big update from the six through eight level is that we've shifted the, we're shifting 
I would say, the model of service delivery, student support service delivery, from one that had a pretty clear general education and special education split, like who did what, to a combined sort of everyone's doing a little bit of everything across the tiers of support. Like everyone's doing a little bit of the universal, everyone's doing a little bit of like the small group, and everyone's doing some of the special education, more specialized um, service delivery. So that is um, a, a change in growth process for the teams and trying to work very collaboratively with them, help have them help us build the way it's gonna work best for their teams and their schools and their students and families. And then last but not least, I wanted to shout out that with the addition of uh, an additional school counselor at the high school and an additional social worker at the high school, they have their capacity to really take on and support the identified mental health and social emotional needs of students has, has increased. They've always done an amazing job to like pull out the support that's needed, but now with some additional staff, we're seeing some kind of exciting developments in being able to be more systematic and programmatic about how they're delivering those supports. So again, for example, they've been able to be really involved with the mental health screening work and not needed as much district-wide support, which it doesn't go without saying is we want, we want our kids to be connected to the adults in their buildings for the support they need. Um, so that's been exciting capacity growth to see at the high school. And I think that's it. Those are my updates. Great. And I'm open to questions if anyone has them. Thank you very um, much. Um, questions or comments from the committee? Ms. Morgan. Hi, thank you. Um, can you talk a little bit about, so what I, the feedback that I have heard from families is that their experience has been that they, their child has been uh, identified through a screener. They've been offered tiered intervention or support, and then that offering has been like, oh, well, yeah, they just don't go to math class. They go to this like SEL session. And what parents have said to me is, well, my kid is stressed, like my kid is anxious about math class, and now they're supposed to miss math class to go to this anxiety workshop and like to do this work. And so I guess, how, like, what are we able to offer kids that doesn't require them to miss their, like, their academic subjects? And how are we doing with that? And what do we need to do, either staffing or funding wise, or just structurally so that we can offer support to kids at times when they're not having to make choices between either going to math class or also going to, you know, the club that they really want to go to because that serves their social and emotional growth as well? Mm -hmm. Yes, <laughs> is my answer, <laughs> no. Um, it is, it is the, the problem with all of those things happening all the time, <laughs> supposed to be happening all the time, is that we do end up in, in those situations where we're digging one hole to fill another, where we do have some, there are some limitations to the school day structure and calendar. Um, this looks a little bit different at every school. Some of the elementary schools have different blocks of time built in. Um, where there's been a more natural ability to, to pull an intervention at, or to schedule an intervention for that time. Um, at, the, at the high school, we, we, we have used the X block period, which is that time to go to a club to, to do some of the other things that are interesting because A, the schedule at the high school makes it so that you could never pull all the kids that need to be in a group together at the same, I mean, it's, kids just aren't available at the same times. And um, so I, I, I will say that is to say we, within the current limits that we have around the schedule and around what time is not already spoken for in the schedule, we have been as creative and flexible as possible. And, and of course, never forcing anyone mm -hmm. And, and saying, you know, if that group time and structure isn't going to work for you, can we get you some support in another way? Dr. So making sure there's always wanna... that offering. Yeah. I, I, a couple of things. First, um, if you are receiving reports that students are being pulled from core content in order to do some of this, it would actually be helpful to know where that's the case because that's not, that's happening. Okay. So we're going to look into that because that is really not the goal. Um, the other thing that I wanted to say about elementary in particular is that we've been talking to the principals about building intervention time directly into the student schedule and having intervention blocks that are designed specifically for whatever a student needs. So having a win block that creates the opportunity 
for students if they need to get extension, if they need to get additional support services, if they need to get services that are already on a grid, that they can do that during a designated time as opposed to having that be coming out. Of course, you also have to then do all of the math associated with each of our content areas and making sure that you're not reducing time in literacy, for example. Um, but it is not an expectation that students are being pulled from core content to receive additional services. So we're going to look into that. <coughs> And I, so, and I, I just, I, I guess for me, like I, I, am excited that you're, that you're here and that you're like, I, I don't know what's like, I, I see interim on the front of the sheet. So that's awesome. And then we see where that goes. Right. <laughs> um, but if this becomes something where there's longevity to this, I, I hope that just, you know, one of the things that you'll look at is where we can create additional opportunities looking beyond you know, and, and usually looking beyond some of our structures that we have costs money and it's, it's something that we have to resource appropriately and I hope that, um, that you will come to us and to Dr. Holman, I'm sure you know, they're obviously open to that. I hope that this is something that making these opportunities available to kids um, if we need to do it somehow that costs more money I, I we want to we want to know what that is so that we can we can do it or or not if that's not you know right. uh, but I'm, I'm i'm glad that you're here um and i think there's there's a lot of work to be done in this area so it's very exciting well and i appreciate you so much for realizing your support for making it happen if it if it takes more resources of whatever those resources may look like um i also want to know like i i have i was not aware specifically the interventions that my folks are working on, like around the mental health screener, are they, that they are actually pulling from core content time. I do know that like at the high school, they pull from Xbox time. At, uh, at the elementary school, sometimes they pull from like lunch, but never, not recess, like we've made it a lunch, kind of lunch group. Um, so if it's happening somewhere else, and it's certainly when it's the types of interventions that I'm directly overseeing, I really, I do want to know as well. Great, thank you. Mr. Cardin. Uh, thanks. Um, so, yeah, I have a couple of different things. Um, and again, <laughs> this is also directed at Ms. Elmer because she's not in term. So, you know, to the extent that there is a, a, something that changes, these are still things like that hopefully the department can work on. So one is that, you know, in the, in the, in the um, strategic plan, MTSS, and outlining what we do for MTSS and sharing that with parents is, very, is one of the key initiatives. And I think... Mm -hmm. SEL should be one of the first areas we do that because that's where the most mystery is right now in the district. People don't know, you know, they, they hear about these, these, these groups that are offered. They hear about, you know, and about counseling sessions, but they don't really know what's available for their students. So there's lots of questions on Facebook about, <laughs> if, you, if, if you're in the group, about, um, you know, my child has anxiety, what do I do, you know? Yeah. So I think that's something that we should prioritizing that initiative is is laying out in a little bit more detail than you did tonight about what the MTSS is that we're offering and 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 how people can access that and sharing that broadly with the public um, the other major item that I thought miss bird was working on um, and I hope will continue is is again outlining our approach to social emotional learning curriculum we've got second step at elementary and then we go to um, responsive classroom at some schools, but not all of them, but then at Gibbs is responsive classroom, but there sort of is at Audison, but not really, and then collaborative problem solving at the high <coughs> school, and then we have advisory blocks different at different places, and at Audison, it's basically just a break, a 10-minute break in the day. You can't really deliver a curriculum in 10 minutes, so looking at that, even if we need to bring in a consultant because we don't have internal resources, I think is a very high priority because I don't think it's very effective. It doesn't seem to be very effective right now. Um, maybe it is more effective than it sounds, but I, I don't know. How, how, what do, what do when you think? You, when you, and when you say the it, you're meaning like the delivery of instruction, of yes, SEL, direct yeah. yeah. I would say I've, we have room to grow okay. as well. And I, I do, I think, and, and like I said before, this is um, very much like the, the, the front of the learning curve for many districts right now, and in some ways, it's exciting here because it's a little farther along than other districts I'm aware of. Um, so, but yeah, I mean, I think this is kind of like the frontier right now and kind of walking, up, walking out of the pandemic, 
re kind of energized around the importance of this kind of learning and support. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, we, I, I, we definitely want to keep building more transparently, at least for the, the public, and, and, and what is going to be effective and meaningful. Mm -hmm. um, I, think, I think curricula are, can be great, and I think curricula can also sometimes never leave the box. I want to make sure that whatever we're doing is really meaningfully getting into the hands of the students and the adults that are tasked with doing it. I think to that point, if we, we all have some learning to do around the castle competencies and how that how that ties into the school day. Mm -hmm. I'm excited to to do some of that teaching and learning and co-designing with with my colleagues in the schools. I'm feeling like there's other energy, there's other people that are matching my energy around being just like, yes, let's do this in a way that gets it there. So, um, so yes, and thank you for the support with, with, for that. Yeah, and definitely those two positions that are grant funded, I mean, I think we, we need to look for a way to incorporate them into future budgets. That's a high priority for me. Great, me too. Um, and last question, so the tier three support where there is individual yes, counseling, yes. is that only offered to people on IEPs or is no, nope. that is sort yes. of a myth that's out. That's one of the myths that's out there. So it is, yeah, it is offered. Individual counseling is a tier three intervention that does often come via an IEP. It rides in on an IEP. There are lots of students at all levels across the district that are getting lots of individualized support, whether it's counseling multiple times, whether it's counseling plus a check in, check out plan, whether, I mean, there's a lot of different ways that you don't have to have any kind of paper product to get the individualized care you need. Um, having the additional capacity, especially like where some of our teams have been able, like the high school team has grown, has really increased our ability to make sure like, you know, there's a gen ed social worker that is just dedicated to seeing all the kids without IEPs that need to come in for support. Now their work might be more to provide school-based needs, but make sure that they're getting connected with community and outpatient needs effectively. Um, because you know it's not necessarily like the like a 12 month model the way an IEP might be yeah. but absolutely we've got people that are delivering individualized support to students okay and then last yeah. quick question there was an article today about cartwheel care i don't know if you saw that they provide yes. services to 16 school districts yes. that that sounds like an an interesting model to i mean obviously we want to have people in the building but as far as supplementing the support i wonder mm -hmm. if that's something we've looked at or would consider looking at I'm very familiar with Cartwell Care. I actually, I actually was a, a sort of founding consultant sounding board to them. I like, actually, I don't know if I'm allowed to share this. Like I, I am employed. I was employed by them. Then I got this role, and then it becomes a little sticky to say yeah. now okay. I'm going to bring my Cartwell Care right, people right, here. Yes. But I would love to get Cartwell Care. For Arlington. The, the model of Cartwell Care, for those that don't know, similar to what we have via interface in terms of helping find long-term therapeutic connections for families and students, but in the meantime, they have a team of clinicians that are providing interim care, like direct services, almost immediately. They're not the only agency out there. They are the only ones that also offer psychiatry. I wish I had never <laughs> gotten my foot in that bucket as well as this bucket, because then I do believe there'd be at least grant funding somewhere that we could use, something I'm happy to explore. Um, Great. But yes, a model like that would be, I, I think would fill one of the holes that everyone has right now, which is the wait times to find a therapist. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, from a lot of us. Anybody else? Mr. Schleckman. Okay. Um, let me take a deep breath. I could go on this topic for a long time because I intellectually knew how social workers were important at one point in my life. Then I became an elementary principal and knew viscerally how important social workers are in an elementary building. Um, I only know Arlington really f from a helicopter perspective of school committee and looking at the budget. And every time I look at the budget, my response is, well, we need more social workers. And that as we designate positions within the budget, social workers tend to be tied to special education. I, I, I guess I'm feeling for a discussion of 
our staffing levels of social workers for general education, for, for the whole building and not just for special ed, uh, particularly from my professional perspective on the elementary level, but I'm certainly interested in the district. Do we have sufficient staffing? What model is appropriate for us to be having in a post-pandemic world that we're in right now, where there's that where the, where there has been a lot of disruption in the lives of children, and there are, there, and while there are missing academics, there is a lot of social mm -hmm. things that that were missing through the developmental process. Um, where do we need to go? I think we are currently. Pr pretty we have a lot of so I feel like we're well resourced in part because I I know the practice of almost every mm -hmm. clinician or counselor in this mm -hmm. district have from having worked here or and now getting to work with them in a different mm -hmm. way they're really high quality counselors and social workers um, model wise I, I don't I don't feel like we have a drastic like disparity between the number of people designated into counseling mm -hmm. and support roles and s counseling and support needs. Mm -hmm. At the same, I mean, at the same time, as a society, we feel like we're mm -hmm. all kind of, I don't know, under this like anvil of mental health need mm -hmm. and not enough hands to hold it up. I think that's just sort of like a collective feeling right now. Mm -hmm. I. I am ex I, I'm hopeful about ways in which we can make the work of the counselors and social workers, counseling and social work work, mm -hmm. and not some of the other stuff that counselors and social workers sometimes get pulled mm -hmm. in to do. Um, so that is a piece of sort of refining our structures and, and keeping open dialogues about the lines of communication between my office and whoever else is working directly with clinical staff about what are you seeing, what are you needing, what do you need to prioritize? How do I help? Mm -hmm. um, I think right now it, it's Yeah, I just working. wanted to but, add, mm -hmm. um, sure. while mm -hmm. the social workers at the elementary level, I think is what you're referring to, mm -hmm. you see tied to the special ed budget, they actually work with general ed and special mm -hmm. ed. It's yeah. just the funding formula. The other thing is um, Dr. Allison Ampey asked uh, a couple weeks ago under this new student services umbrella, mm -hmm. part of what are the opportunities from mm -hmm moving school counseling and social emotional learning under a uh, student services model mm -hmm. is that thinking of our behavioral health mm -hmm. teams as beyond social workers we have school psychologists we have mm -hmm. bcbas we have school nurses we have school counselors and social workers mm -hmm. who all contribute and have a lens on behavioral mm -hmm. health and so i think one of the opportunities with a student service model that we are um, adopting is that we are broadening the number mm -hmm. of folks and not sticking to singular roles and titles. So mm -hmm. I think a little bit of what you're talking about is making sure that the work is coordinated and yeah. um, complementary. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. Anybody else? Thank you all. All right. Thank you so much for being here. We appreciate Thank it. Thank you for having me. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Next, we have a digital learning program presentation which I believe is on Zoom. Mm -hmm. Dr. Homan, do you want to introduce? Um, yes, our I next do. Uh, Ms. Pimpercar, are you pulling this up yourself on Zoom? If you would like me to, I can. Uh, I, or I would suggest it, given some of my technical difficulties, but I think I have solved them. However, that will allow you to sh to share the screen. Um, I think she she probably wants to drive the slides though. Um, so as um, Ms. Primpercar gets everything pulled up. I just want to say I have really enjoyed working with her. She joined, joined the district um, when I did and has brought a, such positive energy and excitement and so much innovation to the Arlington Public Schools alongside her team in libraries and digital learning. We're focused on digital learning tonight. We'll probably be or definitely will be bringing her back to talk to us about libraries a little bit later this spring. Um, and uh, Ms. Pimpercar was featured at the Arlington Education Foundation mm -hmm. Showcase just this past week. Yes, um, showing off some of the unbelievably cool robots that we have now in our classrooms uh, as part of our computer science work. So take it away, Rashmi. 
can everyone see the slide deck yes. and yes. can hear yep. us? Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Um, just a second. Awesome. Um, good evening, everyone. Um, thank you so much, honorable members of the school committee, um, Dr. Homan, um, the community at large, Dr. McNeil. I'm, I'm sorry, I see a small window. Um, thank you, Allison, Rob, Michael, and all present there um, for this opportunity to talk to you about the digital learning program at EPS. Um, with me tonight are my wonderful colleagues, uh, Robin Peasley and Erin Gill, our, who are our elementary digital learning specialists. Uh, Joanna Galvin, who is our middle school digital learning specialist. Um, Jeff Snyder, our high school digital learning specialist, unfortunately, is not feeling well, so he could not join us today, but is absolutely cheering for us with a glass of some warm green tea. He likes green tea, so um, please. Uh, in addition, we want to share a quick shout out to our lead DL, sorry, lead DL educators uh, from each of our schools who actively model um, integrating digital literacies into our teaching and learning on a regular basis. Um, so that's uh, that's sort of the digital learning team um, in 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 a sh in short. But we are much more when we do interdisciplinary work, which is all the faculty um, in APS. Um, give me a quick second. Awesome. Um, I, I'm invoking Dr. Seymour Papert here uh, because Dr. Seymour Papert's transformative theory of constructionism um, has and will continually impact deeper learning um, science research for all learners. Um, and it's across the globe um, and so very close to us at MIT Media Lab. He actually formulated MIT Media Lab. Um, and his theory, just to give a quick glimpse, is built on um, a lot of you probably know Piaget's theory of constructivism and Vygotsky's theory of zone of proximal development. Um, and his theory proposes the best way to ensure that knowledge is built in a learner is through the active construction of something shareable. Um, and he talks a lot about a poem, a program, a sandcastle, a model, or an idea. So it's very inclusive. Uh, but it also emphasizes that it can be improved upon by seeking and incorporating a trade of feedback. That sort of um, is what inspires us as a digital team. Um, and it's also in our vision for APS. Um, and we endeavor to create opportunities for learners to actively engage with um, educational technologies in purposeful, intentional, ethical, iterative, and constructive ways. So it's it's a it's a very intentional way of creating our curriculum and engaging with the faculty, uh, especially around professional learning. And we'll talk a little bit about that. Um, this is our digital learning at a glance. Um, can everyone still see the slide deck? It just appeared to be a bit hazy at my end. No, nope, we can see it. Awesome, thank you. Um, the digital learning team strives to support the students, teachers, um, administrators, school professionals and community in many intentional ways. So for example, we provide support and learning guides for um, over 150 plus ed tech applications, systems and platforms across the district. That's just one part of it. But more importantly, we advocate for, procure, update and maintain a database of student data privacy contracts for each of the ed tech applications that are used in the district. This is super helpful because it keeps our students data private and safe. Um, so that's one of the systematic or processes that we, we engage in on a daily basis, on an annual basis. We also collaborate with various departments in designing um, necessary supports, potential structures, um, and professional learning experiences. So everyone can um, sort of look at ed tech as a tool that they can use successfully and with a purpose. Um, but the most important part of our work is, of course, with faculty and students. Uh, we develop, teach, and iterate interdisciplinary curriculum units that are aligned to the Massachusetts Digital Literacy and Computer Science Standards and uh, with a specific focus on interdisciplinary content. Um, our focus is always to facilitate or help facilitate learning experiences for all learners where they um, sort of see technology as a way to, to create, to, to engage, to communicate, to, um, to sort of simulate situations and more importantly, engage with an iterative problem-solving process. And that's both for faculty and student. 
Um, here are some standards that we, standards, guidelines, and frameworks that we use um, in, in informing the work that we do. Um, and of course, I've linked them in here for, uh, for your in-depth perusal, so I'm not going to, um, into this, but UDL is sort of our foundation stone um, in terms of how we engage with um, the learning experiences. Um, I also want to quickly um, sort of give you a glance. This is a rough draft of our live curriculum grid wherein we are currently developing a trading and posting lessons and curriculum units that are aligned to specific DLCS standards with interdisciplinary alignments. I keep repeating interdisciplinary because that's the world we live in. Nothing is sort of in isolation. We communicate with each other. We make sure problems are touching multiple places, multiple topics, multiple content areas. So we try to do that with our curriculum development. Uh, we are part of DESI DLCS learning community and uh, we regularly collaborate with districts across Massachusetts, Rhode Island, and New Hampshire, who all sort of are engaging in a similar curriculum development effort and are involved in an iterative process. So that helps us tremendously. Um, and we hope to make all of this curriculum and resources live on, uh, on our website so that you know, community that is our Arlington community and community beyond Arlington can sort of use it and give us um, iterative feedback so that we can improve, um, improve our content. Um, this is a quick example of um, how we plan um, or design our professional learning sessions and resources that we provide during our session. Um, this is an example session of our EdTech accessibility tool for all learners called Google Read and Write. Um, I just wanna give a quick shout out to Dr. Homan and Allison because um, they relentlessly helped, um, you know, they, they really pulled out all staffs to get us this tool um, and for the district because it, it is really helpful for all our kids and faculty to be able to use a tool such as Google Read and Write. Um, just to go back to our professional learning model, um, our sessions are usually designed with three uh, sections in mind. The first one is a launch section where we provide the necessary information and a live demonstration of the tool. The second section of our professional learning is usually titled learning by doing. And I've linked all the learning by doing guide in here so you can, you can take a look at how it's structured. Um, but the learning by doing is where the learners engage in various activities to learn the objectives by doing. Um, and it's the learn by doing part which actually comes from Dr. Papert's philosophy but it's literally how we learn. Um, and then we find how they struggle or as they're learning, they find certain new ways of approaching the content. Uh, we design these activities with an intentional focus of being interdisciplinary, and we always try to model the UDL guidelines. So that's sort of the cornerstone of it. Um, and last part is of course, the question and answers and reflection section, which is again, part of that iterative learning process, which informs the learning that needs to come next. Um, I, I had the good fortune of meeting a lot of you during the, the AEF, a joyful presentation where we had the BBOT and Finches um, modeled at the, um, and we had a few of the maths, but this is how the curriculum looks like. This is a quick glimpse of the curriculum unit at the challenges. These are just three of them. Um, the following three are from uh, address the shapes, life cycle, and literacy. So you can see the Hungry Caterpillar, Hungry Caterpillar book. Uh, but you know we have seven challenges that we have defined or designed with teachers, and then we have more that we are um, sort of co-developing with teachers as we go into the classrooms. Um, we are again Ms. super. Ms. Sorry, Picar, I just want to let you know you have about four minutes left. Thank you. So Thank you. you. Um, manage your time. Absolutely. Um, I'm going to go quickly through just a big shout out to AEF and everyone. Um, this is the DLCS Finches um, that we are hoping to um, now develop in our integration. This is, again, our microcontrollers and our kids are going to be engaging with this and they might come home with Fitbits. So please use them and give them feedback. I want to hand it over um, to my uh, wonderful team. But before that, I just want to show you uh, what we are hoping to achieve. Right now, we have the BBOTs and the Finches in here, but we hope to get a gamut of this toolkit 
with grants, with AEF support, with your support, so that we can sort of uh, cultivate this for our K-12 um, classrooms. Um, and I'll hand it over to Robin Peasley and Erin Gill, who are our elementary specialists, who will give you a glimpse of uh, the elementary um, um, highlights. Just a second. Hi everyone, I'm Erin Gill. I am the digital learning specialist for elementary school. Um, I'm just gonna kind of go over some of the things that we do. Um, we are currently developing and teaching digital literacy and computer science curriculum models into our fourth and fifth grade ACE block classes. Um, additionally, as you've already seen in our BBOT integration example, we've really been working to integrate the BBOTs into the classrooms of K-2 students at all, sub all seven of our elementary schools. And as mentioned before, we support all students, faculty, and families from all seven elementary schools with any and all ed tech questions. Um, and Rashmi, if you could click on the link to the lesson on Common Sense Media, um, we just wanted to provide you with an example of a lesson that we have been using in our classrooms with fourth grade specifically. Um, and this lesson highlights the importance of media balance, which we have found to be especially relevant for students to reflect upon their own media consumption and how they can find balance in their own lives. Um, this particular lesson comes from Common Sense Media, which is a great resource that we use a lot in our classroom. And each lesson includes teaching points, short videos, discussion questions, activities, and assessments, which we find really engaging with students. Thank you. I'm gonna hand it over to Robin. Hi, everyone. Um, my name is Robin Peasley. And because of your support, we were able to add one digital learning specialist this fall, Miss Erin Gill. We love her so much. We now have one digital learning specialist for every four elementary schools. We would very much appreciate your support in getting two more digital learning specialists for our pre-K to five schools so we can have a ratio of one digital learning specialist per two schools. This will allow us to focus on student learning, um, curriculum development, individual school needs, and continue, and continue to build relationships with teachers, students, and school community. Thank you again. And I'm going to hand it over to our middle school digital learning specialist, Joanna Galvin. Hi. Awesome. And I just wanna be mindful of the time. We have about a minute left so that we can have time for the committee to ask questions as well. Sure. So I'll just say, hi, everyone. I'm Joanna Galvin. I'm the um, digital learning specialist for Gibbs and Audison. Uh, thank you for having us. Currently, we are developing and look forward to integrating um, DLCS curriculum modules into all of our classes for grades six through eight. We've linked a um, lesson there that you can take a look at um, from Common Sense Media. It's a sixth grade lesson. In addition to the curriculum work, as we've mentioned, we support all of the teachers, students, and community members with all of the ed tech tool related questions. Um, and we're also supporting schools in new initiatives, uh, such as the Lightspeed Chromebook classroom management. Thank you again. Since Jeff Snyder is not here tonight, we just wanted to um, highlight some of the awesome things he's also doing at the high school. Um. I, I know we have 30 seconds and if, if I could just play the video so you can see how joyful our kids are, which you already know, but it's just amazing to see them and talk about the academic content and collaborate with each other and being kind to each other. So just a quick glimpse of what our kid, 24 seconds. That's fine. I think we made it in time. Uh, we would love to take questions from you um, and really, really are thankful for your kind support. Thank you very much. Questions or comments from the committee? Mr. Cardin. Uh, first, I wanna thank you. Your, yours is the first presentation that where the links in Novus worked. So I don't know, I don't know how, I don't know how that happened, but, uh, piece of but that's great. Um, Cause usually we get 
uh, links and they don't work for some reason. But anyways, thank you. Um, just a sort of a question about how you work with the curriculum leaders. So, you know, during during COVID, there was a lot of movement of of work to things like Dreambox or or, or things like that, and as out of necessity. And we've heard some feedback that there's still a lot going on. You know, a lot of assignments in Dreambox and other online tools, and that may or may not be the best in, for our students. How, how do you how do you work like with the math department on analyzing if that's the best way to deliver curriculum? Um, that's a great question. Thank you. Um, Dreambox is. Um, we work with department. We take the department lead in terms of uh, the curriculum or the curriculum tools, ed tech tools that they are recommending. We help them roster, we help them um, sort of navigate the tool uh, and we integrate that into Clever so students can access it, students and teachers. They can also track data. Um, we, when asked, we do give um, data about how it's being used, how much it's being used. Um, and anecdotal data, of course, is there because our digital learning specialists are in the schools. Um, however, we do not, we refrain from saying this tool as a department, um, if the de department is recommending it, we, we actually align ourselves as much as possible with the department tool that they're recommending. We do recommend Desmos. In addition, we do, do recommend other tools that can uh, provide a visual, um, uh, visual models for certain mathematical examples. So those are some of the ways in which we support that. Great, thank you. Mr. Slickman. Okay, elephant in the room. To, uh, tell me about the chat GPT and uh, what we Ooh. need to be thinking about. <laughs> um, it, it, it's, um, it's an AI tool now mm -hmm. uh, that all our children know, um, and many of them have used it. They have used chat GPT and the new Google tool as well, which they'll tell you the bash has come out. Um, so. They know about it. In APS, it is blocked. Um, however, there, there is some scaffolding that needs to happen um, in terms of why this tool is there, how, because you, you, you want to create an ecosystem that is about, um, these are all creators. Our children are able to create technologies such as these. Um, so what are, again, the ethical use of technology and um, a lot of that comes from discussion, a lot of that comes from reading and writing and recognizing what are the pitfalls of using technologies that give, um, you know, non-dynamic, which is not active kind of engagement. And chat GPT unfortunately ends up in there um, because if, if you're using it for plagiarism, then that is hurting you as a student, as a learner. Um, so that's where we are. It is blocked in, G, uh, in APS right now. Uh, but it's not blocked on BYOD, and it is not blocked on the machines that they have at home. Mm -hmm. Can I just say one thing? Erin yep. and I just watched an incredible webinar on it the other day, and they said you have to be 18 years old to, in order to use it, and the data is not protected. So I'm not sure if a lot of people know that, but I know it's constantly changing. And I just heard yesterday that Microsoft is going to use it in their browser yeah. in Bing. So, mm -hmm. well, nobody knows uh, it, it's my cat uh, on the internet either. I mean, it, it's hard to enforce an age limit. Yeah. Uh, right. I'm just wondering, I mean, any, anytime there's an advance in technology, it's usually the students who get there first and then yes. uh, the, us adults have to catch up. Uh, I'm just wondering if there's anything we need to be thinking about on our end in terms of our curriculum and how we, uh, uh, how we teach and, and do discourse uh, as a result of the arrival of uh, a, a more commonly available AI. Absolutely. You, you, um, you said the two key words, right? Through our curriculum, through our uh, learning, through our discourse, mm -hmm. um, through examples that they find through research as well as we provide. So it's, mm -hmm. it's an ecosystem that that needs a little bit of scaffolding from us. Um, and of course, um, an intentional effort on our part to, to bring out these cases, because there are many, many cases where 
um, students are using it for coding purposes. They, they are able to grab code and then modify it. What does that mean? How does that track? It, it, is it static? So those are the kinds of um, evolving question, which does challenge us because we are, as you very correctly said, we are always one step behind um, the children and which is a great thing, but it's also, um, it's also something that um, helps us learn. I think. <laughs> okay, thank you. Uh, thank you. Um, thank you very much for this presentation. I uh, was at the, when you presented to the AEF as well. And um, <clears throat> so one of my questions is, it sounded like, it sounds like um, in third, fourth, and fifth grade, this, not all of the students um, have the opportunity to to do the digital learning because if I think if I understand correctly, if you take an instrument, it's the students who are still in the classroom, I, and I'm, whoever. Um, but I guess I'm, my question is, you know, I appreciate you asking for more for more digital learning specialists, and I think that that's important. But um, I want to make sure that if we're going to do something like that, that every student um, in the school has access to the learning. And I don't, Dr. Homan, do you? Rashmi has ideas about what this could look like. Okay. Do you want her? <laughs> yeah. It doesn't have to be a, a, an answer today. I just want to go ahead, Rashmi. I, I just want to give you a huge shout out for saying that. Um, yes, that is the vision. We, we right now work with the library team because they do have the K3 block, but with Erin and Robin um, split between seven schools and Joanna between two schools, um, we really would appreciate. Um, two more wonderful digital learning specialists um, who, and then we, we hope to do K, K5, um, of course, six to eight and nine to 12. So that, that's, the, that's absolutely the goal. Uh, when we do the STEAM and robotics units, we all go in literally uh, because we do robotic Olympics uh, in the classrooms. We have six challenges going on as you saw. Um, and so if you give us the two, we will invite you in as well to, to join us our, our Robotics Olympics, so please. And so you, f you feel like... Can, I, can yeah. I also add on to that? I think that if we have more digital learning specialists in the district, we can do more integration. And it's also like to go along with the di direct instruction. So it's also working with teachers in order mm -hmm. to integrate these uh, interdisciplinary skills around digital learning into the classroom. And so if we have more individuals to do that, we can push into more classrooms. We have more access, accessibility um, to the curriculum. Thank you. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you very much for your presentation. We appreciate it. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you, Joanna, Erin, Robin. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> if somebody can just stop sharing there. Thank you. <laughs> okay. Um, next, we have the Elementary Literacy Core Curriculum Update from Dr. McNeil. Thank you. Okay. Yeah. Perfect. Okay. So um, this is just an update on the progress of our literacy program review. So we can go to the next slide. So uh, the objectives of the slide deck is to give an update of the process that we're engaged in right now communicate the plan for parent involvement, provide a draft outline of an implementation plan once a program is identified, and then I'll take comments and questions. So this is a graphic of a timeline of where we are. Uh, this outlines the things that we've already uh, completed. We have completed two rounds of literacy program review, and that's all K-5 staff have been involved in that. Uh, they use a tool that we have uh, received from the Hill for Literacy, the Hill for Literacy, which we've partnered through, partnered with through this process. Uh, we're right now, uh, we just started our third round of the literacy program review. And after each round of review, our literacy core team meets to debrief about the process and then we make certain adjustments in order to make um, the process a little bit more um, uh, smooth, to go a little bit more smoothly. Um, from as we receive suggestions from teachers and um, other staff, that, I mean teachers and other staff that are participating in the review process. Um, looking at the next, 
Hold on, no, not yet. Yeah, through the timeline. So um, looking at the winter of 2023, once we go through the literacy program review process, part of the process is, is having a, a staff to uh, attend publisher roundtables. And if you look at the timeline, those are the dates that are right there when those roundtable mm -hmm. discussions are going to happen. So as they are reviewing the tools, looking for evidence of certain things, based as they review the program, looking at the tool and looking at the items and looking for the evidence in the program for those various items, they're also, uh, teachers are also asked to come up with th various mm -hmm. questions that they can pose to the publishers. And then we will have a chance to uh, ask those questions to the publishers during the roundtable discussions. We're also going to have, and I've set up uh, two, I already have two dates for parents to also have a publisher roundtable. So in, you'll see later on in the slide deck that we have resources that parents can access electronically. Um, I've thought about this and reflected on this process in order to involve parents. And this is the best way to do it because it's, it will be much more convenient for parents and also for staff uh, to have parents to be able to access the different program mater materials electronically. <coughs> so once they um, uh, access those uh, program materials electronically, we will have a publisher roundtable for each program. The only one that, I, that is not set yet is the My View Literacy, and I, that's why I have a proposed date. So I am waiting to hear back from the publisher of My View Literacy to confirm uh, March 15th, 6 to 7 p.m. And then as these dates become, um, as we get closer to these dates, I will send out a communication to all parents to let them know and invite them to the roundtable discussion. And then the proposed final date for review of the data is April 6th. Uh, we'll make that, um, we'll look at the data, we'll look at the, the data that we've collected from the program review tools, and then we will make a recommendation to Dr. Holman. And right there at the bottom of the slide, you'll see a link to the, all the, it's like a, it's a, it's a table that has all of the dates in there, um, right there. These, this includes all the dates and all the activities that we have participated in throughout the review process. So we can go to the next slide. So the next few slides are just, um, and I want to uh, emphasize this to all parents who are watching, that um, once you access the slide deck, again, it's in a PDF version, so I'm going to have to send out the slide deck or a message to parents with these links so that they can click on the links. They will have access to the program materials for all grade levels. And then there's other supplemental resources that are right there in the slide as well. And then we have the curate reports. And then we have the ed reports, this is, which is a review on all the programs and the uh, different programs, as you see there in this particular slide for, um, what is that, L education, EL education. You'll see the curate reports for K through two three through five, and then the Ed reports is comprehensive and it's K through five. So the, that slide, slide number four, this slide right here, go to the next slide, that's for um, my view, and then the next slide is for wit and wisdom. So all of those are all the materials that parents will need in order to review the materials, and it will be at their convenience. And then, you go ne next slide. All right, so the implementation plan. And this is just a sketch, because I haven't really revealed this to teachers just yet, but some of the initial ideas is we're going to have to do this. We're going to have to do this in um, different segments. So the first segment will be fourth and fifth grade, because we've <coughs> just completed a lot of work at the early literacy um, levels with our early literacy um, focus, and we've introduced foundations at kindergarten and third grade. We've also uh, introduced Hegarty and the decodable text. So because the teachers are still getting familiar with those materials, and we've also um, implemented the, uh, all of the subtests for Dibbles, teachers are still getting familiar with that. We're going to focus on grades four through five. So we're going to look for those teachers. Um, the goal is to have one fourth grade and one fifth grade classroom become a lab class classroom in each building throughout the district. Those will be teachers who feel like they're comfortable and um, implementing the entire, all of the units in the program that we select. Those uh, teachers will be fully supported with all the professional development throughout the summer. And then we will use those classrooms as lab classrooms so other teachers can come and see how that program is being 
implemented. At the same time next year, all fourth and fifth grade teachers will receive uh, full on professional development throughout the entire year. And teachers who feel comfortable can maybe at some point in time during a year uh, test out one of the units where they feel comfortable they can do one unit throughout the year. So at the end of next year, it will be the expectation going into the following year that all fourth and fifth grade teachers will, be impl will implement the new program. And then we'll start the same pro pro process for the other grade levels. And that is it. How did I do on time? Wow, very impressive, seven minutes. Really, is that a record, is that a record? For you it might be. For me, oh, ooh, ooh, wow. It's the record this evening, is that? Right. Wow, nice, okay, I'll take that. Questions or comments, Mr. Cardin? Uh, your links are working, so maybe it was a Novus upgrade. Everybody, everybody's <laughs> oh, links are working perfect. now. That's that. that um, oh, that's so that's, that's a relief. Yes. Um, but we we had meant I suggested and and I still hope you will send out a communication to parents, uh, especially elementary school parents, that you know where we are in the process. Sure. That these these forms are coming. These materials are now available for them. Here's the link to where the stuff is. And yes, absolutely. Look for that. I'll I'll get that out as soon as possible. Great, thank you. And the implementation plan sounds sounds very very reasonable and um, but yet aggressive. <laughs> it's yes. very balanced. So thank you, Mr. Simmons. Yeah, I just, just I just think it's important to clarify the district is selecting the curriculum. It's not it, you're getting parent input, but it's the superintendent's choice. It's not a school committee vote either, right? I mean, I we would, vote a budget. Yes, um, the core team will provide me with a recommendation and the the time and care that that group has put in under Dr. Right. McNeil's guidance, um, I, I have a hard time imagining that whatever recommendation they were to bring me, that's not what we would go about doing. But yes, it's a district's um, yep. decision with all of the input from mm -hmm. teachers and from everybody else. Yeah, it was, it's always good to mm -hmm. remind the audience of that. Yeah. But it's considered a significant curriculum change, so we ultimately have to vote on it. Yes. That's true. Is that right? Okay. Yes. That's my understanding. Their recommendation would come to me, and then my recommendation would come. And we would, we would right. so we would be taking a vote on this new curriculum. Okay. I just mm -hmm. want to clarify. This. Okay. <coughs> okay. Thank you. Bill. I just want to say thank you. I asked a lot of questions that you answered in this um, <laughs> presentation, so I appreciate all the thought that went into it and um, the the getting information from all of the. Uh, the teachers in the building, not just the classroom teachers or, and the special education teachers, but as I understand it, the music teachers, the art teacher, the PE teacher were all asked to provide feedback. And I, I think that that's, it's important that that many stakeholders um, were able to think about this and provide the, the committee, the literacy committee with um, their feedback. So I appreciate how thorough this process. Thank you very much, and, and thank you for the questions as well. All right. Superintendent's proposed budget for FY24, Dr. Holman. Sure. If you like. While we're waiting, I also want to highlight that um, Ms. Elmer and Ms. Perry are also co-chairs of that literacy core team. So mm -hmm. they're thought partners as well. And, and so it's been our collective leadership that has helped move this along. OK. I believe I'm getting us started, yes? Can we hand off to you? Yeah, of course, yes. Good evening, members of the school committee. It is uh, myself and Mr. Mason's pleasure to bring to you the superintendent's proposed budget for FY24. I want to start by thanking the students who contributed the artwork for the front cover once again this year. Uh, we had a lot of potential artwork to choose from, as you know, because we have a spectacular art department. And we're thrilled that we can grace the cover of this year's budget book with more student work. I want to begin by highlighting some of the priorities and highlights of the document that you received. Um, shortly before this meeting in which the public will have the opportunity to review offer their commentary on and that you will also have an opportunity to offer your feedback on tonight and ongoing 
Our priorities were to make sure that we addressed increasing enrollments at the secondary level our, as our enrollments have leveled off at the elementary level. We are seeing some of those bigger classes move through the Gibbs, the Audison, and now the high school. Uh, we wanted to make sure that we are ensuring equitable distribution of support staff at our elementary and secondary level and have completed some of the efforts we had started last year to make sure that we have math interventionists, appropriate levels of English learner and special education staffing um, at all levels. We want to expand the capacity of the system to address our achievement and opportunity gaps in alignment with our uh, soon to be implemented strategic plan as well as the operational capacity of the system in response to organizational growth. As you know, we expanded a lot of student facing um, roles and didn't make a lot of adjustments as student enrollment was increasing to some of the operational capacity that surrounds those student enrollments. And so some of these objectives are tied to that. We also need to make sure that we staff the new Arlington High School building to meet the demands of that building and the new programming that was written into the programming proposal when we initially imagined what that new building would look like. And of course, we want to plan for the implementation of our five-year strategic plan, which includes um, several items that have a dollar sign attached to them. Some of the highlights that you'll see in this year's proposed budget are additional English learner teachers to match increased enrollment um, at a couple of schools, particularly at Pierce and OMS. Um, some additional, an additional .5 special education team chair at Gibbs to meet the demands of students uh, with IEPs at that school. An additional elementary librarian, additional elementary math interventionists um, that come with an offset because we're moving a non-professional role into a professional role in those places, additional teachers at the middle school and high school levels to address enrollment and additional operational staff in the business office uh, and to support the new high school as well as our facilities department. I will hand it off to Mr. Mason who will talk you through some data. Thank you, Dr. Holman. So this, so um, first, you know, part of allocating our budget or looking at our budget is looking at the enrollment. And um, so what we have here is six years of actual um, data from fiscal 18 to fiscal 22 um, with additional projected years um, from our internal projection, which you'll see that's in the green line. Um, these are just for in-district enrollment. This does not include our out-of-district out enrollment, um, which hovers around 60 or so students. Um, for those that are keeping track, looking at the previous October 1 numbers that we've provided. Um, what um, I will say that also it includes two project, uh, three other projections. Uh, two was provided from a vendor more recently, Decision Insight. Um, and another was McKibben. That was the last one provided back in August of 2016. And uh, what I will say to note is that, you know, the McKibben forecasts, uh, as some of us have already discussed and alluded that, you know, is pretty much projected a, a trend line that is actually occurring um, with our current enrollment based on our mathematical projections. And I, I will add to that is that, you know, with any projections, it's hard to uh, actually nail down because of the arbitrary factors or a matter of how you would calculate it. Um, but some of the things that did go into these projections uh, is birth rates, and which we're, which I've been seeing that they are declining, and um, they also some of the other projections did look at real estate data or transactions mm -hmm. to the best of their abilities, um, and other data sources. But overall, um, what what you'll see, as Dr. Holman alluded to in the highlights, is that. Um, we're going to we're seeing our enrollment bubble work through the up mid to upper grade levels right now So that's where our resources will be allocated in this budget So the next slide is revenue sources uh, um, For the last five years um, which shows our main sources of revenue is comes from the town appropriation um, which uh, include um, it's a formula that's uh, been agreed upon in the long-range plan, but it includes funding that's from Chapter 70 state aid and um, local tax dollars, um, which, which the community of Arlington uh, contributes to the town. And then we do have our, our normal entitlement grants and our special revenue revolving, as well as circuit breaks. Also included is, uh, in, in 
in our numbers, and this is the last year you will we'll see this, um, is the COVID-19 grant funding sources. So that um, the one you'll see in this year is ESSER, ESSER 3, which we'll talk about and how we're going to intend to use the remaining of those funds because those funds expire September of 2024, which will be slightly after the fiscal 24 ending period. If you go to the next slide, um, you'll see that the majority of our budget is funded, and this is a snapshot for fiscal 24, what we anticipate our funding sources to be, which is over 91% is, um, or 90, about 91% 90 is um, from the town appropriation, which is the chapter 70 dollars, which is the equitable funding uh, formula in the state of Mass and the local taxpayers. And then we also, show that in red is the, the grants portion, which is about 3%, which can fluctuate up or down. Um, our special revenue and circuit breaker is another about 4.6%. And then the orange sliver, which is so little compared, um, the, which is about $900,000, is just the COVID-related grants. If you go to the next slide, um, you'll see that this is um, based on the school committee voted uh, budget transfer categories. Um, this is how our operating budget breaks down for fiscal 24 and this proposed budget. You'll notice that, you know, the main big sectors are elementary education uh, and secondary education, which is nearly 27% each. And then uh, special education uh, uh, related spending is around 25.4. Um, with administration and then curriculum instruction, uh, hover around 6% and other, which includes transportation, facilities, um, IT, uh, and other special revenue fund funding sources um, that could be used for various purposes are at around 10%. So this is how the numbers break down. Um, so between, uh, we got, we're seeing an increase of from the, the local contribution and the chapter 70, so the town appropriation about $4.4 million, um, which is about 5.33% if you add the two together, um, respectively. It assumes that um, in the current long range plan that we have a 3% increase in chapter 70 state aid. As this is the, new, the first year for the governor, um, those state aid numbers are, have not been released yet. Um, in our grants, since we do not know what we're expected for grant allocations, uh, we always level fund, um, assuming that we're going to get the same amount. These numbers can increase. Sometimes they do decrease, but uh, mo mainly they do increase, with largely with the IDEA grant uh, being a substantial portion of that. Um, our COVID-related grants, we're, we're itemizing and, um, and pulling it out. And so this year, uh, we're, I'm anticipating that we'll have about $930,000 that we'll be carrying over into fiscal 24 after we do some transfers um, on back onto the general fund for this year's dollars. And that'll give us an increase over last year of one-time spending dollars of $130,000. We'll talk about how we intend to use these additional dollars to help accomplish some of our, our strategic planning items and um, um, head start some, jump start some some other initiatives. And then there is some one-time spending that is gonna be happening from that, those grants. And then as well as the seeing an increase in special revenue and revolving about 350,000, doesn't mean that we're necessarily gonna get an increase in funds, but it's based on increase in the spending, the spend down balances that we have on the books. And then we did see a decrease in what we're receiving for Circuit Breaker over the prior year. We're still carrying over prior year um, revenue. So this this year we're, in, we're receiving about $1.9 million, which is about $383,000 less for circuit breaker, which overall gives the 5.37% increase that we're anticipating to get or uh, $4.9 million of, over our prior fiscal 23 budget. So to break down the math and get you to, and before I hand it over to Dr. Holman and get the boring, this, all the boring stuff out the way, um, is that, you know, you know, we're looking at a total operating budget um, of our main funds for about $95.1 million and adding in the 936000 added from ESSER. When you take away what we had without the, the, the COVID grants last year, it was about $90.6 from fiscal 23. 
which leaves us with an actual budget increase between years of 5.4 million, which we've already covered. So after taking away um, contractual obligations in COLA, which is around 2.3, 2.4 million, we estimate um, there's some, you know, it doesn't consider staffing and those who may retire or leave and how we replace those and what savings or we may not have savings happen when we do hire replacements. Um, but we also um, have our, uh, our, we're increasing our out of district tuition and transportation. I know that there's some discussion about that might happen around the transportation line item that I'll have to look into. Um, utility increases we're anticipating. Um, this reduced from a previous estimate um, and uh, to be able to actually balance the budget but also in, with one of the initiatives in the budget that Dr. Holman will touch upon, we hope that that role can help save some costs and utilities. And then also with uh, increasing department budgets, about $450,000 across the board, um, as well as 1.3 in proposed budget efficiencies, that leaves us about $3.1 million to actually allocate for our things that we like to do. So I hand that over to Dr. Holman who can explain it so eloquently about what we're going to be doing for fiscal 24. Okay. So um, actually I, w I thought you were going to do efficiencies and I was going to do that. Oh, oh yeah. So I'm so <laughs> I'm very sorry. I, my, my apologies. So um, what I will, will say is that um, so we have a couple of budget efficiencies which is um, the starting with the top one which is our Director of uh, Communications and Grants in Title I, which um, the individual will be uh, not necessarily leaving the district, will still be supporting us, and you'll see and explain in terms of an offset that's going to happen out of one-time funds as that person uh, phases out over time. And then um, we'll see that um, there you'll see there's a reduction of teaching assistance. This is all for monotony. Um, this, you'll see that there will be an ad later on. This is an offset to get all of the um, teaching assistants at the uh, specialized support paraprofessional level, SSP level, um, at the Monotomy Preschool. Um, so that offset will be later on in the later slide. Dr. Holman will touch upon. Um, we're transferring a special education teacher from the bracket to the Hardy. Um, so that also be touched. That's an offset for that. As we're doing two math interventionists, so it's going to be offset with, uh, with two uh, SSPs that we'll be saving for that to get a professional level, a professional status um, um, support. And then um, we're doing it, an, the administrative assistant is not necessarily a reduction. Once again, that's a transfer from one office to another um, to provide support in the business office. Um, and we are restructuring and changing the model of from science and social studies coaches to science and social studies um, spe curriculum specialists. Sorry, and then and then last but not least, after like we had a lot of vacant positions on the book this year that were very difficult to fill, um, and and even they were, some of them were vacant prior to that. Um, we decided that um, it might be best to clean clean those off the books and that's what you'll see also in the proposed budget um, which is a bunch of vacancies um, that these are not people losing roles but positions that we were not able to fill and that's going to be able to help us try to all allocate dollars towards other items that we would like to work like to propose in this budget now I'll hand it over to Dr. Holman okay so I'm going to start with uh, proposed additions to support the high school. This includes uh, core area teachers in math, history, and world language at various levels of FTE. Some of this is bringing people who are in current part-time positions up to full-time positions to support additional sections. Um, there, is also, there are also some shared positions between, for example, art and computer science to expand interdisciplinary learning, some of which you heard about uh, when we had the high school program of studies here recently. We have additional teachers as well to support um, some of the elective areas, such as in wellness and facts, in class areas that are frequently oversubscribed when students fill out their course um, selections. And this should help <coughs> us also reduce the number of students who have free blocks, free periods in their, in their schedule because they couldn't get into whatever elective might have been offered during that time. Uh, we also need additional reading support at the high school. We have more students who are coming to the high school with reading services necessary. 
Um, and we would like to add a theater manager to help us support the beautiful um, performing arts space that is built into the new high school. We imagine that this theater manager could actually help us with all of the performing arts spaces. There's a recording studio, there are various technologies available throughout the performing arts area, and there's also the beautiful new discourse lab, um, all of which contain AV equipment that requires specialized knowledge to be able to use, and so that's why that is um, on the proposed ads. There are also spaces like the Smart Lab and School Cafe that will be part of the new programming that require some level of staffing. We'd like to go slow with this and so we're adding point fives in each of those areas. It could potentially be shared in hopes that we can eventually fully staff these spaces with SSP sorts of roles um, who would work directly with students to make sure that um, services are provided in the Smart Lab and in the School Cafe. At the middle school level, we have increased enrollments in, um, of English learners at the uh, middle school level, particularly at OMS, requiring an additional FTE there. We have uh, growing enrollments and we have expanded the um, core area teachers with additional LCs over the past couple of years, but we haven't done the same for some of the um, other classes that sort of surround the core LCs, so we need additional FTEs make sure that the class sizes are manageable in the specialty areas at um, Audison Middle School. And as mentioned before, we are adding a special education team chair at Gibbs and there was an additional efficiency that I'm not sure was in the list that you um, added, but we have a .5 clerical role at Gibbs that we are, that we haven't been able to fill that we'd like to repurpose towards this transitional specialist uh, for the Gibbs, which would help coordinate activities coming into and going out of the Gibbs and making sure that we have a smooth transition through that only school that has only a single year um, of students in that space. So they're kind of con in constant transition mode and this role would replace the .5 clerical in order to help make sure that that is a really smooth smooth transition, we're imagining that person would work care closely with the Welcome Center to, to uh, support orientations and other transition activities at the middle grade levels. Um, for Ella preschool and elementary proposed additions, we are, uh, you saw the offset of the special education SLC teacher uh, at Bracket. That program is moving to Hardy um, and will be, need to be fully staffed with two classroom teachers this year. A additional ELL teacher at Pierce to support growing enrollments there and as well as a special education liaison at Pierce uh, to make sure that they have an appropriate ratio of special education teachers at that building. The additional math interventionist, which again is just a transition from a non-professionally um, licensed role into a full math interventionist licensed teacher role. Um, instrumental music teachers to support the growth in instrumental music uh, across our system because of the reduction in fees. An additional elementary school librarian to continue the work that we're trying to do to build out that programming. Um, and an adjustment to create uh, sp specialized support paraprofessionals at Menomonee Preschool um, where there were previously TAs. That's the offset that was earlier in the efficiencies. As for district-wide proposed additions, um, there has been an adjustment of, so there was an efficiency of an assistant in my office um, to become assistant to the assistant superintendent of finance and operations, creating a clerical role in the business office. That again is uh, budget neutral because of the offset. A building systems manager, which was part of the um, high school plan, was to have somebody who would manage some of the automation systems that are part of our newer buildings. Uh, this would be a district-wide role that would help us manage the efficiencies of all of our buildings, but would be housed primarily at the high school to make sure that this building systems are running efficiently, uh, which helps offset some of the cost of electric that Mr. Mason was, or of, of energy, which Mr. Mason was talking about um, earlier, and utilities. There's an increase in hours for payroll staff. As mentioned before, we've increased um, instructional staff along with the increase in student enrollments. We've also increased staff as a result, which means we've increased the demand on the payroll office, which requires us to make sure that those people can keep up with paying all of our people, which is very important. Um, the grant administrator role that was an offset in the efficiencies will move over into the business office as a full-time grant administrator. That role currently is shared with communications and I'll explain that as part of the ESSER dollars in a moment. Um, and as you saw before, the coaches turned to specialists um, and there is also a, the reading teacher I'm a little confused by, Mr. Mason. Didn't I already talk about that over at AHS? I'm not sure why that's on district wide. So we'll take a look at it that. Might that might be a duplicate. <laughs> so that's not an additional reading teacher at AHS. Yes. 
Um, and then for ESSER 3, we know that there is hesitation and concern about us having a lot of positions on the ESSER 3 dollars, especially positions that we are interested in maintaining out through multiple years. So we did as much as we could to keep positions that we think we might like to have in the out years um, away from these dollars so we're not over committing ourselves to future budgets ahead of knowing what the outcome of future budgets might actually be. Uh, that said, we do have um, some specialty roles on the ESSER 3 proposed additions that we would like to try out, assess, and then make some decisions around once we know dollar amounts for future budgets. This includes uh, DEI specialists, a director of research data and accountability, which we would post as a one-year role. Um, this would be to do some setup work in collaboration with the deputy superintendent uh, around a dashboard for, to you know, project the success of our strategic plan. Um, to get some data systems and, and routines in place um, and to do some analysis aligned with our strategic plan as well as to try out this role. This is a role we've talked about in the past, whether or not it should be at the director role level, whether or not it should be at the teacher level, um, and what kinds of skill sets we thought we needed available for that. I would like to try it in this way and um, take, take a look at what we think the impact of it is and assess whether or not we want to keep it in future budgets. There's also Director of Communication and Family Engagement. This is one that we would want to keep. This would be the Director of a Welcome Center um, and the new Central Office. This role would oversee all aspects of district-wide communication, registration, and enrollment, and would work as a member of the Cabinet team. We've also included a Counseling Director for Arlington High School. It would be specific to counseling and to overseeing counseling, <coughs> as well as coordination of 504s across the district, which at the moment don't have um, a lot of consistency in terms of how they tend to be implemented and carried forward across multiple years. Uh, this person would, because high school counseling is a very different thing from counseling and social work at some of the lower levels, would be responsible for helping also with the coordination of the high school schedule, which currently falls on one of the many, uh, the few administrators in the building. Um, and it's usually that the schedule falls in a counseling department, but the way the counseling department's currently structured, it doesn't. It falls on a single high school administrator. Um, and so the goal is to move some of that responsibility back into the counseling office in order to open up space for those administrators to do teaching and learning work and uh, help with supervisory loads that right now are pretty heavy also on our directors. Um, there is a communication specialist. This uh, is a role that we are not sure would continue um, in the system, but it would be to help us clean up some of the aspects of the new website that need to be reorganized um, to help build some systems around communications and some expectations around communications that we could share out with all of our administrators in the district linked to some of the goals of our strategic plans, as well as an expansion of instructional leadership team stipends uh, which we have done a lot with this year, and teachers on the ILT told us this is a lot of work. We think we should be paid more for it, so we would like to pay them more for it um, and try to get that into future budgets as we are able. And there, uh, the other one-time spending on SR3, I would have to defer to Mr. Mason on. I am not sure what the plan is for some of the one-time spending. Some of, some of the one-time spending include um, also indirect charges that will be tied to this to this, the personnel related mm -hmm. to this grant um, and any um, ideas of any of uh, instructional support that might be needed through the district, whether it's equipment or um, technology purchases. And curriculum purchases. Um, it, this, that, those dollars could allow us to get slightly ahead, though uh, Dr. McNeil has reminded us that it is important that we make sure whatever we purchase is newest edition, so we would probably prioritize purchasing fourth and fifth grade materials for the new literacy curriculum over getting ahead on grades two and three, because it's possible that they would roll out updated resources in the next couple of years, so we wouldn't want to be too out and far, far out in front of that. All right, and our remaining steps are that we will have a school committee meeting um, in March for a public hearing at the beginning of March and then mid-March for a tentative date for a vote on the superintendent's proposed budget. We would visit the finance committee in March and town meeting in April. I'll take, we'll take any questions that you have. Thank you. Questions, comments? Mr. Hainer? Just a minor one. Back on the uh, elementary proposed additions, mm -hmm. uh, instrumental music teacher, 1.2. 
I assumed you based it on a seventy thousand dollar for one point oh. Shouldn't that be a little bit more? Um, well, that's that's the math and the, the spreadsheet. So <laughs> it's actually not. It's a minor it's, question. It's actually, not one point two. It's just it's one point one six. That's right. It's the actual FTE. I, so that I, was I calculated. Sh I should have known you had the answer. Yeah. Thank that, you. That's, that's the one point one six. <laughs> Mr. Carden. Um, so looking at the budget efficiencies from vacancies, there's um, four or five specialized support paraprofessionals that look like they support SLCs. Are we able to operate the SLCs without those people? What do you mean without? They're vacancy. They're, oh. they're positions that are vacant now. They're in the budget, but they're vacant because we weren't able to fill them. We've been using them contracted um, providers. So Sorry. We've been using contracted providers, um, so the positions are still posted. These aren't the ones. So these, these are, are positions that are not posted, are not filled, are not filled by service providers, are not, like, right now they're just vacant and they've been vacant. We, one of the ways that we're thinking about doing this is we're trying to take a look at positions that we have not filled at all this year. And we did have a rapid expansion of TA positions during the pandemic that we never looked back at and said, what should the proportion of TAs to students in a building be? And I think that changes depending on whether or not you have a program in the building. So to your point, if you have a program um, that requires a lot of hands-on um, work with students, then you might have more TAs in the building. But we haven't gone back and right-sized from the pandemic the number of FTEs we have in a building. And as a result, we sometimes have vacancies that it just isn't that important to the school to really try to fill as much as it is to try to fill a vacancy over here or to bring in a contracted service. So we've cleared some vacancies from the list and the and we've added some reserve positions to the budget. And what we're planning on doing is saying if these are services that you in building your schedules are you're not able to work with the staffing that you have then provide us with some data that tells us that you're going to need additional staffing in order to provide these services we have reserve positions in the budget um, our hope would be that we could use those towards some proactive roles like moving something off of ESSER into the general fund um, or adding some additional digital learning teachers or librarians but if we find that the need is so great and that we can't adjust schedules and use our service providers efficiently and we need an additional service provider in a space because of what the student needs are, then we can use those reserve positions to add back um, some staff. We, we took from areas where the proportion of TAs to students in that building were particularly high even given the fact that there might have been a program in that space. So I just, just I misunderstood up. your question because um, the positions that are filled though by contracted service providers are actually being rolled over in the budget. Correct. Yes. Those vacancies Correct. are being maintained Correct. so that we will be hiring yeah. ideally for next year first because we can't supplant um, unit uh, D positions that those those vacancies are the ones right. that are. Yeah. Okay. And so it's not advantageous for us to continue to contract those, those positions out. Mm -hmm. Right. I mean, what, what Dr. Homan said, what, Sounded sounded correct for teaching assistants, but I'm talking about the specialized support professionals, which are budgeted under special education. And it sounds like they're not positions that we couldn't fill, but they're legacy positions that were in the budget mistakenly or for some reason, right? Without without yeah, without getting. Too I think we need. I think I'd like more detail on yeah, it. Yeah yeah yeah. I think without getting too nuanced, operationally. Uh, leaders do make changes in their buildings mm -hmm. and instead of the roles being changed in compensation a staff member held uh, SSP level pay even though they weren't may have not been in that same role anymore because they were shifted around and those roles have been been carried in the budget and so now um, this is to correct that but I can give you more data Dr. Allison, oh, yes. I, I just wanted to follow up because I had this similar question, um, and I'm just going to ask it again to make sure. So my concern is when I look at the efficiencies, I see three SLPs for Stratton for special education being eliminated. And there aren't that many paras in that building. So I'm just concerned whether 
our students have the support that they need and whether we're vanishing something that they need. But it sounds like Ms. Elmer was saying that they're being, it's being staffed by contracted. So there's certain positions. I misunderstood his question. I thought he was asking about the ones that have been vacant this year that we have been staffing okay. with contracted providers. No, I'm talking about. Yep. Okay. I know. I, I yes. now realize what you're talking okay. about. So I right. was responding to it. Okay. What I thought was a different question. Okay. Well, then I asked my question if it's not addressed by your thing. So, so I'm concerned that it seems like a lot. I mean, I'm concerned about the other SLPs and other schools too, but three of them from a school that only has 14 to start with seems like a lot. And especially since they're not all in the SLCs. I mean, it just, it, under the Stratton heading, it says for Paris that there's, oops, I'm wrong, there's 16.8 in, F, in uh, FY23, and then we're getting rid of I'm confused whether it's four or five because there's different numbers in different places of Paris. Two of them are TAs, three of them are SLPs. SSPs. 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 Sorry, sorry, sorry. SSPs. But it just feels like a lot for the program, and I just don't understand. And I'm concerned. So, sorry, I was not trying to interrupt Mr. Carden. I had kind of the same question. If I could just respond. Um, well, I mean, A, I, I'd like to further investigate for you to, to, to give you some reassurance, but I'm sure that these positions have been vacant for over a year and they've been operating. Um, but secondly, but. is that not every, <laughs> not every position that's an SSP actually is funded under the particular school's budget. So there are district-wide accounts that you would have to dive deep into the budget, which I'd like to give a chance to do, because they're not necessarily nested under that. They may be under a, a 81. I, I'm going to be oh, Okay, so they have, yeah. they they may have be, there may ones. be places, yes. other people in there that aren't right. showing up in that little box. Okay, right. that's fine, mm -hmm. but I still feel like three out of what can't be a huge number is a lot. It's actually it, five. Mm -hmm. Well, no, it's 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 For two TAs school. and three. Yeah, it's two TAs and three SLPs. SSPs. SSPs. Sorry, I'm sorry. I don't know why I yeah. keep saying this. Is, yeah. SSP. Um, so I do also just want to add that SSPs serve multiple purposes. So you may have a, a, a one to one that was with a student who then moves on mm -hmm. to give. We are trying to get better at making sure the position goes with the student. Yes. But as Michael was saying, sometimes those positions stay in the building. Gibbs hires a new one-to-one -one for that student, and that's where some excess may come from. So when Michael gathers more detail, we can tell you about exactly those positions that are listed. Okay. We've also had a decrease of, of the number of students in the SLC. Um, we peaked at about 33, I believe, two years ago. Um, we're around 24 or 25 right now. So the question to a position has remained vacant this year. Mm -hmm. Like there's also fewer students in that program. Mm -hmm. So they may not have needed as many staff, but I think it would be helpful to get more detail, especially from Dr. Hanna. Yeah. And then, then the other follow up was just, I understand that they've been functioning, but that doesn't mean they've been functionally functioning mm -hmm. optimally. Yeah. Yeah. Right, and that's my concern is if we're getting rid of the money that would pay for the person, then we can't hire the person if we find one. So well, and to the point Ms. Elmer made, in those places where that functionality is significantly impacted by the fact that there's not somebody there, that's where we've gone to an agency because we simply, n we know that that need is there, it's evident to us. Mm -hmm. And these are positions that have been vacant for significantly longer than that, which makes us question whether the need is there, but like I said, we have the reserve positions at least in part because we want to make sure we have a little bit of room to add. And, and the vacant positions, note for an SSP would be, you know, two of them within one of those vacant positions, the capacity to add. So that gives us the a little bit more flexibility to as assess once schedules are built and once we've tried to place students strategically, whether or not we actually will have need for additional support because we're not meeting students services in any of those classrooms. Okay. I, if I can add one more thing, I just also imagine that um, besides reserves is that 
over the summer, if we do the, we're going to do that analysis of the turnovers, right? Mm -hmm. And so I'd imagine that there are going to be positions that we still will have trouble filling and that we will then be able to assess the need. If there are other, like, more important needs or higher level needs, um, such as an SSP, we will then can allocate those resources at that point in time as well. So I, 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 I don't want to necessarily run the same level of access that we ran this year. Yeah. And so that's also part of the consideration okay. here. Okay, thanks. Mr. Thielman. Thanks very much. I, I just, I'm, the um, ESSER funds, the uh, elementary, secondary school emergency relief funds, they expire, that goes through June 30. September. September. Mm -hmm. so, so, uh, 20, 20, 24. 2024. Okay, and then, okay, so these, this $936,000 worth of uh, positions, we're hope, we're obviously hoping <laughs> that there's enough revenue the following year to cover those positions with our, um, with non ESSER funds. And do you? Not, not, not all positions. All okay. Yeah, I think there's a f one or two positions. One position that needs to be reassessed. Okay. After the first year, and then the other position may get carried over. Well, you, could you clarify that? What, what position needs to be reassessed then? You, you said that and I missed it. The, the, I, well, the uh, research data and accountability we would post as a one-year position. You have, okay. All right. The communication specialist we would also post as a one-year position. Okay. And then you would just see based on mm -hmm. budget. Okay. All right. I just want a clarification. Thank you. Ms. Morgan. Still working on the mental gymnastics of the ESSER because that's mm -hmm. it's tough for everybody because um, this is a deviation for us and that's why like mm -hmm. a lot of us are feeling really itchy. Um, so what you just said, Dr. Homan, like three minutes ago was if we don't need these reserve positions for the SSPs or whatever else, then maybe we move some stuff off of ESSER. But like we have to spend that ESSER money next year, right? So like we can move it off in our mental gymnastics when we do the vacancy, when we do the efficiency mm -hmm. add reconciliation for FY25, but we really can't move any of these things off of ESSER because we've got to pay these things. We, we have to spend that Not money. without spending it on something else. Right. Yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, great. So that makes sense to me. Um, Mr. Mason has been very patient with my pages <laughs> of questions this week. Um, I am all sorted on the Bishop bus, um, which is great. One thing that I noticed um, was that in the revenue, it looks like we put the, because I, I was worried about where the COVID infusion went, the 600,000 that we had agreed to with, like that we have a tentative agreement with, um, about it looks like that was put in the FY20 operating override edition row for FY24 as opposed to in the COVID-19 infusion. I believe that $600,000 is still, yeah. we're still it's calling it a COVID infusion. So we want that in the like five rows down, I think, because the FY20, the override editions, there aren't any for 24. Um, so on page 17, yeah, the chart, um, so I think that needs to go down because it, we, there, so, which brings me to my next comment. <laughs> yes. Does that make sense? Yeah, no, no. What I will say, if I could respond, is that if you look at the PDF document at the moment, the PDF document is going to always be, going to be slightly different. So as I get feedback and updates from the members of the committee and my team, we are going to be consistently updating the link that was provided earlier. So, um, <clears throat> I did do an update to, um, I believe that page you're referring to, okay. um, but it may have not been converted to a PDF, and then re re Got put it. in. So okay, I I've been very good about being in the Google Doc oh, all I week, see. and then I, I made the mistake of switching over to Novus for our meeting, so that's why I'm not following. Them. Okay, perfect. Mm -hmm. So that's great. So, um, so there there are no override additions presently. No in for FY24, that is a still a debate, right, that we are, are having. And I, you know, for, for me, I, I, I am very supportive of, of the additions in this budget. I do think that we've made, while not explicitly called out, we are making some important adjustments um, 
for uh, Unit D, the math interventionist positions being transitioned, the work that we're doing at the preschool around making those um, important reclassifications uh, to a you know slightly higher pay scale. So I'm glad that we're doing all of those things. I um, and. I do hope that if we are able to secure additional funds for FY24 as part of the override, that we will use those to um, to look at our at our contract. Um, my personal preference, I want to look at the Unit D contract, but you know we can debate that. Um, I, I want I want to make sure that if we do secure additional funds for FY24, that that my preference is to not. Uh, work through additional positional ads, but to use that toward contractual um, adjustments. So I, I just want to say that here because we're talking about the FY24 budget, and most of it is, you know, the most of it is locked down. But if there are additional funds that we're able to secure um, contingent on the, the override, um, that's what I want to do with that. Um, and otherwise, you know, this is a, a huge undertaking. Um, and um, I, I'm very impressed with where we're at, and I know we've got you know some more time before we need to vote this, um, and we have budget tomorrow morning, so that'll be super fun. Uh, so thank you so much. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Mr. Cardin. Sorry, just one more question, one more comment. So, Dr. Homer, what you just said about the director of communication troubles me a little bit. I mean, if our intent is to find the funding for that. I actually think there's other things that we're adding, like the transition specialist at Gibbs, that is would be easier to fill and is more likely, also is, and is equally uh, cuttable if we have to make cuts. So I think if you're posting that position for just for one year, that's going to affect the candidate pool. If you flop those two, you're still short forty thousand dollars. But um, there, there may be other there may be other th I think that director of communications position is more important to be in the base budget than some of the other stuff. Just a, just feedback to consider. Let me clarify one thing. The one I said was we would post as a one year was the communications specialist role and okay. the director of research data and accountability role. The reason for some of that is tied to personnel. Okay. I thought you said director of communication. The director okay. of communication family engagement we would post as a permanent role. Okay. Um, but I take your feedback about maybe looking at other positions to move into the ESSER versus mm -hmm. the base. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Um, so I just had a couple other comments right now, um, also about ESSER. First, are we sure that the ESSER f spending that we're uh, anticipating meets the grant requirements? I mean, that, that we check, we're checking all the boxes that, that it does what they want, okay. Um, and, and that's another thing, as we m move things around, we need to be sure that we're still doing. And second, for the positions that we're talking about funding for one year, um, I'd like to hear something at a future date about how we're evaluating the position success. You know, how, how do we decide is this worth doing or, or what are we going to learn from this and then go back and, and check that out at the end. So. Yeah, the only, I, I just want to focus on the other unknown in here is the enrollment. Is that we did have that drop after the pandemic and we did gain some back in two different ways. Uh, a sm it appears from the state data that we had some kids who were redshirted in kindergarten in 2020 and came in in 2021. Uh, but there's also just this permanent gap of 10, 20, 30 students, whatever, who disappeared at that point and haven't come back yet. But I'm tracking the entry year for kindergarten because before 2020, we were. Um, uh, we were declining a little. We went from 522 to 587, the peak, mm -hmm. uh, down to 524, and then boom, with the pandemic, it went to 453. Mm -hmm. Two subsequent years were 486. So I'm wondering if that thing is going to sort of stabilize and start to pop back up again. I mean, McKibben projection on, on the graph 
uh, seemed to be the really sharp one in that when he did this, he was looking, he brought in a whole bunch of uh, real estate trans, he, he brought in a whole bunch of real estate transactions in there. So having done mm -hmm. some projections, uh, I, 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 when I was doing this, all doing it statistically and not with the depth that McKibben did. Yeah. So I'm wondering, you know, I'm wondering, given both the fact that the town is looking to be more inclusive in terms of its housing and development, as well as uh, uh, the possibility that number is going to kick kick up again. Um, I, I hate seeing those low numbers in the, in, in the projection in the graph because I just don't think they're un, they're they're really that realistic. You know what I mean? Absolutely understand what you're saying. Um, once again, you know, many factors, as you know, go into doing a projection. Mm -hmm. I, w what I will say is that you know, our earlier years mm -hmm. um, that you're referring to had births at. as high as 600, mm -hmm. um, I mean over 600, mm -hmm. you know, um, to upper 500s. Mm -hmm. And so now what we're looking at is low 400s mm -hmm. to mid 400s um, in terms of birth birth data. And so, I mean, you're you, you, you bring up an interesting point mm -hmm. that if, you know, if there are any zoning changes or any any particular change in terms of uh, housing opportunities, yes, that I can see an uptick that these projections just won't provide. Yeah. Um, but those are things that are hard to, pre to predict in general. The, the, one th the, other, the other thing that sort of worries me is with the housing prices going up is that younger families who are it's really young mm -hmm. are less likely to be able to afford to come in, but will have a few more earning years and uh, more incentive to relocate into a community where they like the school so that th there would be a, an uptick between birth to K mm -hmm. uh, demographically. Um, yeah, I, it, it, it's, it's always a puzzle. I don't, I, I don't have the answers. I just want to play with those questions and think about uh, strategically long range what we may be looking at because we may, we may hit an, nobody saw the increases that came after 2012. Mm -hmm. That was really a demographic shift in, in terms of young folks who were willing to raise children in smaller housing units. Yeah. Uh, and so I, I, think, I think we're still a desirable community um, and that we, we, I think there's still room for even that sort of development plus uh, new housing that might be coming in. Thank you both very much for all of your work on this. And uh, discuss it more. Thank you for the monotony, Paris. Thank you. And actually, I'm going to just stop before um, if Tamaki and Amy, if you would like to leave, you are welcome yes. to move on. <laughs> You're welcome to stay, but I don't want you to feel like you need to, uh, to stay. All right. Um, the second read on the school year 2023-2024 uh, calendar. Mm -hmm. Dr. Holman, do you want to? So you have an update for the calendar. What we um, are hoping might be able to happen tonight, we had actually moved the, the timeline on giving you a first read of the proposed calendar up a couple a couple of weeks up a meeting um, so that we could address some concerns that were coming in from the community and talk about some of the data that we had gotten back from our surveys. We're hoping because we're still trying to nail down uh, things like conference dates and which dates will be our all release for district-wide PD days. Um, we, we don't have those in here yet. We have made some significant revisions based on some of the feedback that we received at the last meeting. So we're hoping that we can review and discuss and then have another couple of weeks before we do a vote because we know there will be some additions and changes. We can do that. I also, I just wanted to, we could vote this so that families and teachers can know when the first day of school and the last day of school and mm -hmm. I believe all of the vacations and professional days are mm -hmm. accurate now mm -hmm. and then 
you can bring us an updated calendar that we can revote when um, the early release days and the conferences are in there. Sure. I just want to confirm before we do that, the elementary will continue to have an early release every single Wednesday. Yes. Okay. Um, so it's the secondary. Mm -hmm. the, the, the secondary district. all days yes. that we haven't that we nailed haven't down done. yet. Okay. Correct. Motion to <laughs> approve a preliminary calendar. Confirming the starting date. Okay. Yes. So, well, okay. We, this, this preliminary calendar, yes. which has the start date, mm -hmm. the holidays, and the holidays. Yeah. Yes. But that is a preliminary calendar because there are things to be filled in. Okay. Mm -hmm. We have a motion by Mr. Schlickman. Would someone second. like to second it? <laughs> we second. So we're just pre we're not doing two readings. We're just going to just approve well, this. We, this we is saw the second this reading. La yeah. yeah. This is the second. This reading. is the second read. Right. So when we have those other pieces, we'll bring them back to the mm -hmm. committee. I'm clear. We've done that in the past. Yes, we have. Okay. So we have a motion by Mr. Schlickman, seconded by Mr. Hainer, to do a preliminary approval of this calendar discussion. Ms. Morgan. Yes. Yeah, so the plan for AHS. Um, so right now, the the plan for I did follow up on this, um, and the plan for AHS is not to have um, is to have departmentalized days where we move departments, uh, and then the students on those days wouldn't have the class in the department that is moving as opposed to having half days or having days off to facilitate the move. So there would not be half days or days off at AHS to facilitate the move, but there would be a day where the history department is moving, students do not have history class. Okay. Does that make sense? And, and that's over how many days? I, that detail we still don't have the exact, it wouldn't be more than two from what I understand right now. Um, like the history department would move over two days, but I need to double check that still with the folks who are organizing the high school move. Okay. So is it going to, like the number that we had when we made the recommendation to the building committee to, to retain Fusco so that we could mm -hmm. eliminate disruptions on kids was that the move was going to take five days and that two of them could be over a weekend. So it's really it was three school days. And then the question I had asked was about the 25th of September, which is um, Yom Kippur. Mm -hmm. And so is that like, so I guess what I, I, I guess you're, you can bring us a plan, but it just, it, are we now talking about having like, if it's two days per department, then that, there's a lot of departments. Like, are we talking like 12 days of moving? Like the 12 days of Christmas? Like, no. Okay. <laughs> no. Um, oh, of course. Yeah, okay. So it's just history, English, foreign language. Yeah, and not even all of the English classes need to move um, because some are already over in the new wing. Okay. Um, it's, it's the bulk of history and social studies and world language, it's not every department. Um, and we would still be able to use some weekend time to facilitate the move. It's mostly the get your, and we will have teachers getting their rooms, not really un, fully unpacking a room. So they may not need a full day to prep their room. And then they would need a full day once they're in the new building to get their rooms prepared. So that would be, they would be two days in a department would be get your room prepared to be moved out of and then get your room prepared once your stuff has been moved probably overnight into the space or over a weekend into the space to get your room set back up. Okay. So it, it would be helpful, I think, because it sounds like it has the capacity to have an, I mean, I, I would be grateful when there's a more like, concrete plan for us to just have a chance to see it so that it we can sort of just get a sense of how big the impact is on learning time across you know multiple days because mm -hmm. that would be that would be helpful and I just want to make sure that this is a pretty significant deviation from which is fine it seems like it's a good one I didn't you know who knew this was good this was a possibility um, it just it feels like a significant change from what we had agreed to it on the face of it seems like an improvement which is great but it would be helpful to hear about it so that we know whether it really is so dr alexander thank you 
I think part of the problem is that it's going to depend on when the building is done. Mm -hmm. And so we can't, you know, we could look for efficiencies, but if the building's not done to correlate with Rosh Hashanah or, or uh, whatever holiday, we won't be able to use those. Mm -hmm. So it's something we can have a plan, but the plan may change late because uh, it turns out that it's not done. We heard at the last, at the building committee meeting on Tuesday that as of the start of January, they were 31 days behind schedule, but then at the end of January, they were only 19 days behind schedule. So they, they have the ability to make up time, but still those are, you know, that's a lot of time to catch up. Would have been nice if they could make up like 10 days and just do it before school starts. Well, yeah, but, yeah. Mr. Yeah. Thielman. Yeah, so the, we're not gonna have a, a really clear schedule till the summer. So it's just, it's just not gonna be known until the summer. Mm -hmm. Mr. Hainer. I'm on the Permanent Town Building Committee. I gotta tell you, from everything that I've heard, the high school is really efficient, making up and fixing time compared to the other two building constructions. Granted, they're not dealing with kids. I'll give you that. But uh, the town yard and uh, the uh, senior center. Yeah. Let me. I, I think they're gonna make up time and get very close. I, I do, yeah. based on their history, but we're not gonna know that. And we mm -hmm. can't make Correct. that promise until right. sometime in the mm -hmm. summer. But they're gonna get close to the 19th. Yeah, they'll get yeah. close. To, they'll get yeah. rid of those 19. Okay, days. so let's we're not let's stay focused yeah. on approving this preliminary calendar. We can talk more about um, the moving dates. Any other discussion on approving this preliminary calendar? Okay, we had a motion by Mr. Schlickman, seconded by Mr. Hainer. Those in favor? Aye. Yes. 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 Opposed? Abstentions? That's unanimous. Windows helps too, right? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, so now we're gonna, um, we can take a possible vote for approval of the AHS Nordic Ski Team. Um, I think everyone knows this, but um, Mr. Bowler at the beginning of each school year presents a list of teams that AHS will be competing in, in the MIAA um, for that year. So he, he can um, present the ski team, but since it's been a topic of discussion, we felt that it was important to for the committee to acknowledge um, this team. And I want to confirm, Dr. Homan, that that is, that is Mr. Bowler. Bowler's plan. Mm -hmm. Okay. Right. All right. So would someone like to make a motion to approve the AHS Nordic Ski Team? So moved. Second. We have a motion by Mr. Thielman, seconded by Mr. Hainer. Any discussion? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Yes. Opposed? Abstentions? That's unanimous. Six zero zero seven zero. Oh, getting late. Okay. Um, an update on the implementation of policy ECEV electric vehicles. Mr. Schlickman. Signs are up. Signs are up. Uh, <laughs> this this is sort of prod things along, and I know that the superintendent has requested the police chief to send the parking enforcement people over there as well. Mm -hmm. That's all. Thank you. Superintendent's update, Dr. Homan. Hold on one moment. Okay. So I have a few um, sort of good news items to share with the school committee. We had an LGBTQIA plus task force, which is a task force of the Rainbow Commission that's been uh, liaising with um, their wonderful liaison, Dr. McNeil, over the past uh, about two years now. Mm -hmm. um, and they had a forum for families on January 22nd, which was one of the days that um, poor weather threatened to shut down our after school activities. And despite the uh, threat of slippery streets, we had 30 plus families um, attend mm -hmm. that session and hear from a panel of mm -hmm. students um, and teachers about the work that we're doing in Arlington Public Schools to support our LGBTQIA plus uh, identifying students. And so that was a wonderful opportunity to hear about the experiences of students mm -hmm. as well as some of the work, innovative work our teachers are doing. And there was some fantastic and a very um, rich discussion amongst the participants in that forum about some of what we are doing well and what we can continue to improve. 
We had the AESF Grants Showcase, the first in-person one, as I understand it, in about three years. Mm -hmm. On January 30th, there were a lot of really exceptional projects by mm -hmm. some of our educators and partners in town um, showing off some of the innovative work that's happening in the Arlington Public Schools. Pictured there is Ms. Pimpercar from earlier tonight uh, speaking as one of the keynote speakers at the showcase. We also have published a new professional development course list uh, for our educators for the second half of the year, and we've had two sessions? One session? One session um, for the new, on, under, under the new menu. Mm -hmm. And uh, listed there are a few of the offerings that are some of our newer offerings being offered by both consultants and our own um, educators, some very exciting ones. We still have our affinity groups running. Those were running last um, last semester as well. We have a new program, Understanding the Arlington METCO program, another one, How Gender Expansive Youth Engage in Educational Experiences, uh, as well as um, some uh, sessions on reading instruction and early literacy, and so, so, so many more really cool um, mm. opportunities for teachers. The feedback, Dr. McNeil, mm -hmm. Um, lets me know every single time the feedback comes in that it is overwhelmingly positive. And we've gotten some really great feedback too from teachers on mm. some little things that we can tweak to make this even better next year. So we're looking forward mm. to continuing and expanding on this approach. Um, we are about to enter a strategic planning public comment phase. Um, and I am going to be pr um, creating a video that's fairly straightforward. I hope nobody expects very many frills. Uh, with this video, <laughs> mostly just going to talk through exactly what is in the plan as quickly as possible so that if people don't want to read lots of really long documents, they don't have to. Um, and then we'll have a forum where families can submit some feedback, tell us what they really like in the plan and what sounds compelling and what they hope to see out of it and if they think we've missed anything. Um, we're also going to work sort of more long range with ACMI and some students who are part of the UVU group at the high school to produce a little bit more of a promotional video that sort of explains the plan once it's approved so that we can share it out more broadly um, so that we can sort of have something that talks about the key elements of the plan that are really exciting and actually have some students and teachers talking about what they think belonging is going to look like, what they get from the new vision statement and what they're excited about in some of the new initiatives. Uh, we are going to enter into a public comment period next week once we have a chance to get the video out to community members um, and then that will be updated with translation following our collaborations with students because the translation piece in particular takes a long time to get turned around. We're going to try to do that as quickly as possible. We just returned um, members of the central office team as well as a building leader and a curriculum leader from the Deeper Learning Dozen convening um, at High Tech High. We visited high tech schools from elementary through high school to learn about how deeper <coughs> and project-based learning approaches have worked there and also how the system itself has worked to create cohesion um, of professional learning opportunities, of additional planning and co-planning time for teachers. It is a public school within, it's within a public system, but it uses a lottery-based approach to assign students to it so that they can create a demographically representative group of students within the high-tech system. So it was really interesting to learn about a public system that has established coherence in deeper learning and project-based learning as part of their model with a lot of really innovative work around how they do teacher professional development. Um, so it was great to visit those schools and talk to those teachers and students about what that looks like for them mm -hmm. and to learn from that and think about what pieces we might want to bring back. Uh, we did a leadership reconvening tonight of all of the 120 plus people who were part of our August leadership workshop, including members of our school ILTs. Uh, pictured right here is the sixth grade Gibbs chorus getting us kicked off this evening. That was impromptu. We weren't expecting to do it, but they had just finished rehearsing a song for the first time, and they came in and performed it for 120 people. Good for them, <laughs> and they did beautifully. It was so much fun. So that was just to compare notes on how ILT work is doing um, and to make sure that we have a chance to reconnect and remember some of the work we did last August so that we can prepare in the last half of the year uh, to think about what a strong start to next year will look like. We just received an Afghan Refugee Support for Schools grant in the amount of $20,162. That's going to go towards supporting teachers and providing support staff such as tutors to our students who have been recently relocated into Arlington. We have several um, students who are refugees from Afghanistan, and so we're grateful for the opportunity for that grant from DESE and that we have received um, some funds from it. I wanted to provide a little bit of an update on frigid cold and broken pipes, which we had over last weekend. Uh, it got exceptionally cold last weekend, mm -hmm. as everybody knows. Um, we flew out of San Diego and into a very, very, very cold Boston. 
Um, and we did have some issues with broken pipes, particularly at Brackett, uh, where a pipe burst and impacted the front office, main office area and lobby, uh, the music room, which is right off of the lobby, and a room that's used for intervention and coaching, which is right off of the um, main office. So luckily, no core classrooms were impacted by this. We are working on figuring out what the repairs uh, process is going to look like. We did need to rip some of the walls apart a little bit, so it's um, looking a little bit like we have some work to do in there right now, but the whole bracket team has been exceptionally mm -hmm. gracious, and we had a huge crew of facilities, maintenance, custodians, um, principals donating their time from other schools there over the weekend helping with the cleanup, mm -hmm. and we're really grateful for all of the help that they provided over the weekend. Mm -hmm. um, and that because of that, we were able to open on Monday, which was really mm -hmm. great news. We also had a couple of pipes that froze in other places, but we were able to slowly warm them up, and so they didn't result in a burst pipe, mm -hmm. which was great news. I also wanted to provide update on communication that was recently sent out by some district administrators following the tragic death um, of Tyree Nichols, and that communication came out last Monday, and there was some verbiage in it that was objectionable to members of our community. And I just wanted to acknowledge that we're doing work with the Arlington Police Department. I've been in close collaboration with Chief Flaherty, as has uh, Margaret Ta Creedle Thomas, our director of DEI. And we're planning on engaging in a conversation with them next week about some of the impact of some of that messaging, um, which was intended to talk about the impact of institutional racism on all of our institutions, not only on policing institutions, but that's true of a lot of our institutions. It failed to acknowledge in that messaging the work that all, a lot of our institutions, including the APD, have been doing to dismantle institutionalized racism. So we acknowledge that some of the words that we used um, and the way they were put together uh, had a pretty negative impact on some members of our community. We want to hear what that impact was. We also want to talk about how we move forward in a shared dialogue, and we're committed to making sure that that dialogue happens. We're very grateful for our partners across town in all departments, um, and I wanted to make sure everybody knew we were working closely with them to learn from our experiences. When we talk about things like race and violence, we're sure to sometimes say things in an unfortunate mm -hmm. way, mm -hmm. and we will learn from those, those instances and grow from them. And finally, enrollments are in your materials, and I am happy to take any questions that you have. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Dr. Homan. Consent agenda. All items listed with an asterisk are considered to be routine and will be enacted by one motion. There will be no separate discussion of these items unless a member of the committee so requests, in which event the item will be considered in its normal sequence. Warrant number 23165, dated January 24th, 2023, in the amount of $741,638.58. <clears throat> Warrant number 23174, dated February 7th, 2023, in the amount of $655,493.45. Meeting minutes January 12th, 2023. Meeting minutes January 26th, 2023. Move to approve as presented. Second. We have a motion by Mr. Hainer, seconded by Mr. Schlickman. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? And I'm going to abstain. All right, subcommittee leads on reports and announcements. Budget, Dr. Allison Ampey. Budget will meet tomorrow to discuss um, the budget and uh, more work on preparing for a long range plan meeting for next week. Community relations, Mr. Hainer. Uh, the school committee chat for LGBTQ plus families will be this Saturday, February 11th, from 11 a.m. to 12 p.m. I want to just restate that the purpose of these chats are for the two school committee members uh, who are present are there to listen and to pass on concerns. Uh, we're not there to solve any problems. <coughs> if we can answer questions that we are aware of, we shall do so. But for the most part, we're there to listen. Thank you. Curriculum instruction, assessment, and accountability. Ms. Morgan? We are having a meeting on March 2nd. Facility? I don't know what we're going to talk about. <laughs> <laughs> mm. I, I mean, there's a list. I don't know what that's on it. We meet on um, Monday, February 13th uh, at 9.15 a.m. for 45 minutes. We have two agenda items, an update on different facilities and then a conversation about this space by the Addison. Uh, policies and procedures. Mr. Schlickman? No report. 
Arlington High School Building Committee, Mr. Thielman. We talked about it during the calendar discussion. <laughs> <laughs> Superintendent evaluation, Mr. Cardin. Nothing to report. Liaison report. Announcement. I have a really quick one, but it's a good one. Ms. Keith. Um, Long-time Audison custodian Cliff Fallis retired this week, mm -hmm. and the man never liked to be the center of attention and snuck out the door with a surprise, it's my last day. So some teachers at the Audison are collecting memories or well wishes, and if you'd like to send one, you can send it to Randy Flynn. It's rflynn at arlington.k12.ma.us, and she's going to put them all into a video and just send him the link so he can watch them on his own and not be in the room with a bunch of people staring at him. <laughs> We wish him well. We don't know what we're going to do without him. Um, but it's, you know, good. We're, we're very happy for him, and he's off on all kinds of grand adventures. Mm -hmm. I believe he was cited by some students at a convenience store at Arlington earlier this week. <laughs> yes, he was a lot of so he's still kind of a hero to the community. Mm -hmm. There are parameters on, like, file type or anything like that that she has or has sent you all? Did you say? Okay. I'll ask her. Thank you. Future agenda items. All right. I will entertain a motion to adjourn. So moved. Second. <laughs> motion by <laughs> Dr. Allison and seconded uh, by Mr. Schlickman. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Abstentions? No, motion favor. passes. <laughs> this meeting is adjourned. Thank you. Thank you. Uh,